Hello everyone, this is the Nameless One, and today we will be doing the Creator Roundup Animators. Before I go ahead and have everybody introduce themselves, I'm going to remind everybody, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, follow on Twitch, all of that good stuff. Uh, there's also the links in the description. I have links for all of the uh, members of the podcast, as well as for ways that you can support the channel more at that more about that at the end um for now we're gonna go ahead and jump right into introductions um i think we're going to do ali chan um you go first uh you're gonna give us who you are what you do and uh, how about we do newest project you're working on if you can talk about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, yeah, I'm Molly Chen. And um, I do 2D animation. Mostly, like, as you can see on the, on the, on the screen, cats. <laughs> and um, I do... I really draw ponies, actually. It's mostly if it's asked for a commission. But, um, yeah... I uh my recent project I would say it's um project I'm doing with uh, I'm Shadow, uh it's uh an Equestria Girls, uh like universe no like alternate universe kind of, and yeah That's it's wild. actually like my first project doing with um with her and um what's it called like human human ponies basically. Okay, Minty, your turn. Hello, I'm Minty Root. I'm working in the animation industry as a CG generalist. I've worked in a couple of live action productions as well. And as an escape from all those complex productions, I work on some fan animations in the fandom, partly because I can actually get to work as a creative as well. Uh, you've probably recognized my work in projects such as Luna's Determination, Missing Out, The Beginning of Harmony, Good Morning Baltimore, and a uh, project I'm currently working on called Project Undercloud Remake, which is hopefully to be released this summer. It's a pretty ambitious story about Derpy Hooves and her past and possibly her future. I don't want to spoil anything. Okay. Vincent? Hello, I am uh, Vincent Visions. I am a professional 3D environment artist. I've worked in the video games industry for about four years. I uh, worked on the attraction uh, Eliminations VillainCon Minion Blast in Universal Studios Orlando. I've done some work on F1 Manager 2022. Um, my current project that is currently in production is, um, you know, you see the dazzlings on screen there. Uh, it involves Sonata, mainly. I don't know if I ever released a title for it yet, but if if I haven't, it's going to be called the Eridonis Project. Fully 3D animated and blunder, very ambitious. Uh, Y'all are in for some treats whenever it's done. Okay. Cole. That's me. Hi, uh, I'm Cole. I do a plethora of things, I guess. Um... In terms of the animation uh, side of stuff, I'm much more of a particles and visual effects person. I am starting to get a little bit more into the traditional hand-drawn stuff, but I have a long way to go, and it's very much of a, a learning curve, but I'm doing what I can. Uh, my main project at the moment is The Journey Once More, which is this massive series about a uh, alicorn living in a realm of memories and it'll also be a fanfic uh not just an animated thing so it'll have uh you'll get the full story before the entire series comes out because the series is going to take me a very 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 long time and i would like to get the story out there before i turn 70 years old so you know that, that's what you gotta do <laughs> EG. Hello everyone, I'm EG Studios. I am a 2D animator, hand-drawn animator. Uh, I've been in the fandom since 2011. Um, and I'm still doing uh, pony animations 
uh, today. I've also been currently working uh, working with uh, with other indie animators uh, outside of Ponies. Um, I am working as a as a colorist for an upcoming uh, a, a animated short uh, and made by made by someone else by the name of um, uh, a Bluebird. I think and that was her name. No, wait, it wasn't Bluebird. But uh, uh, her anim her upcoming animated short project is called um, "The Bard of the Mountain Valley," and and it's we're almost close to produ- to finish production, so we might get that ready by the end of the year. I am also working on two other projects, uh, which is one uh, one with the uh, I Am Shadow, who, uh, who I'm also working with Ali Chan, doing the same Equestria Girls project. Um, yeah, <laughs> and. And as of now, we are getting Shadow and I are also getting ready to work on the next How It Should Have Ended. Yeah, and we've been we have been making five episodes for the last four years, so we are preparing for the next episode as we speak. And and yeah, like a, and I've also been working on my own uh, passion project, and that will tackle on a mixture of of alicorns and and ancient mythology, it, it clash together. Okay. So yeah, that's and, all the stuff I'm working on this year. And last but not least, Rem. Hi, I'm Reminition Violet, and I'm a SFM animator. I usually make a lot of like shit post content, admittedly, but I also want to actually make some serious content as well. Um, I've kind of been like a mixture of a YouTube channel as well. Like I kind of don't just do SFM. I like for my latest video was like more or less an anthology for specifically Starlight. Um, and so I do stuff like that. In fact, my uh, upcoming project is not even like really an animation. I'll get to that in just a second. But, you know, I've been animating for about one year now, uh, around that time, about a year now. And I've been a YouTuber for about two. And I've been in the fandom since 2014. But didn't really start making content until recently second, but you know and I've been my for current about big project one. is more or less a editing project more than anything else uh it's basically going to be ADHD personified i'm going to be incorrectly summarizing uh MLP episodes um it's based off a series by the youtuber known, known as Maxor uh which is literally the series is called an incorrect summary of and it's like I said, just ADHD personified. I'm going to be having like an edit every three in a joke, like every three seconds. And it is a very tough project to work on. Okay. So to go ahead and get started, I think we will go with for the first question what is for each of you? And this goes for whether or not it's uh, not character or animation or whatnot, but uh, what is the most difficult part of uh, starting an animation project for you? And we will start with Vincent. Ooh, okay. Let's see. I'm starting a project. Um... I could say that writing can definitely be a challenge, um, especially the one that I'm doing where there's, like, I plan to do, like, a few parts, each, like, 10 to 15 minutes long, and from episode to episode, or even a short animation, it's always about a balance between what is right to you, but what also audiences will enjoy. So, it's like, if you want... It's a humor based. You want to do it. You want to make sure your jokes land properly. If it's a thought provoking story, you want to make sure that it addresses them properly. You want to make sure your pacing is right. Like, there's so much you could talk about for writing. But, long story short, I would say that writing in the initial pitch can be a challenge. Typically, especially in writing, I have a difficulty with the in betweens. Like, I know how it starts, I know how it ends, but how do we get from point A to point B? Let's say that's been my challenge as far as starting productions. Okay. Let's see. Minty. Oh, starting the project doesn't really have much in terms of hard tasks, in part because starting it just implies putting all the things that you have to uh, put together. Uh, I want to see uh, putting the script together might be the hardest part of starting uh, because the script 
has a lot of implications, for example, because uh, you have to look at the kind of budgets that you have uh, for that kind of project. So I'm going to tell myself, I'm going to have a year and a half tops to complete everything. I'm going to have those characters. So trying to make a script that fits all those needs and still has the story I have in mind, uh, because sometimes whenever you have a kind of story you want to pull together, you're going to have to compromise to get it to work. Uh, you might have to change a bit some of the locations to make it work. You might have to trim down some dialogue. You might have to uh, trim whole scenes that you think would be very important and somehow find a way to make the, the, the elements of that scene fit with everything else and not make it feel contrived because uh, I had that problem back in the days uh, trying to pull a whole story uh, together but realizing that I need to have the, the, the resources to pull it off. And doing the wrong decisions to pull it off uh, within what they had in terms of budget was... Uh, so basically, I, I think the toughest part is mostly just looking at a script and telling myself, like, this script is 12 pages long. I need to cut it down to 10 because of the length I can animate and the length uh, that I expect. And then having to see, like, what can I trim? What can I uh, use shortcuts with? Because sometimes with the uh, story, you have some elements that you can use to add some depth to characters without having to need an extra scene where you cut to a different event to tell the same thing again. Uh, it's pretty tricky. It's, it's um, Because I was not really trained uh, in terms of storytelling, so I learned a lot from uh, the one class I had at school that involved uh, writing for animation, and that's mostly it. Uh, a lot of it also comes down to just asking people I know the, for their advice, and of course, with the that kind of the script writing, you also have to uh, storyboard everything, and also have to also budget to pull the whole story together with the kind of um, the kind of animation you have. So you might have a couple of characters where you realize that I will never have the time to rig those characters. So can I? What can I do with as limited of a rig for those characters as possible? Uh, and sometimes you realize, like, Cadence shows up for one shot. She's going to be seen from one angle, so I'm just going to make a rig that works from that angle. That's it. So a lot of it just comes down to that kind of constraint. And uh, it's something that also applies with the animation industry, where you realize that you have uh, you have some really cool ideas to pull a shot together, and you're told, yeah, we don't have the budget for that on that production, even though the production has tens of millions of dollars worth. So... Okay. Cole, your turn. Oh, me. Uh, I guess somewhat similar to what uh, what Vincent was saying about, like, just story elements. Like, really trying to make sure that uh, everything that you're doing is fitting the story. And again, that's also similar to what Minty was saying. You know, like, oh, what can be cut? Well, you know, what can be added? What can be... What's too much? What's not enough? There's a lot of... Just balancing the the story and especially when it's all going to be done visually because like as i said with the thing that i'm working on uh it's going to be a fan fiction and a series but there are things that are going to have to play out differently in both because certain things work better in writing and certain things will work better visually so i got to figure that out like what's going to be one-to-one -one with the book and what's going to be just a different experience that gets you to the same result um so there's a lot of just like figuring out you know the timing and ugh. but like yeah starting definitely is just getting all of the story elements together and knowing okay here's what needs to be uh ha well here's what needs to happen in the video here's what doesn't need to happen and, uh, and since i'm also working with like pmv stuff i have to work within the confines of the music that i'm working with so there's th there's that too um yeah it, it's just, again it all just comes down to story and uh that's probably the the greatest challenge i feel like when it comes to visuals i feel like any hurdle can be overcome eventually you know i mean it might take me a while to learn how to animate a character doing something but that's on me and there's nothing really holding me back but myself but when it comes to the story i really have to like think and like really go places in my mind that are just deep and everywhere so yeah story story is hard okay eg <laughs> yeah, I have to agree with uh, both Mindy and uh, Nicole on this. That yeah, <laughs> I would also agree that um, uh, starting well, to notice a theme. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Story is definitely uh, a challenge. A challenge, but it's honestly the way that will help you clear uh, your a uh, uh, clear your head on how uh, what kind of animation you want to present. Because here's the thing, like it, like from what I've noticed in in the fandom, they always it, it put so much focus on making the animation pretty as possible with without putting a, a focus so much on story. So it's you gotta find the right balance between both uh both story wise and animation wise, how much you want to put in there. So and um and I would say and that was a challenge I went through a lot and too in my early years. Uh, I put too much focus on animation that it it, it that you. And that um you easily burn out so and if you're just like the only animator doing everything if we're a short it, it can be exhausting so it, there are times you might have to cut the corners but still make it look well pre- make it, it you gotta make it presentable very presentable uh, and that and make it memorable uh which is what matters making the animation too pretty will just uh, would just become It'll become less of a. It'll, it'll become less of an innovative thing and more of a spectacle with no charm. Yeah. So, like I said, eh, like I said, uh, 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 sto- yeah, putting the focus on on story, finding your limitations on how much you want to animate. Um, it's finding that balance between both uh, both level uh, both fields. Okay, Allie. Man, okay, so uh, my thing is, I don't really work on the story side, mostly. I just make the things look pretty. Uh, I just like to, um, what's it called? Um, make the visuals of the story that I've been told. For example, with the um, that project I'm working with, I'm Shadow and EG, uh, she has, we talked about the script, but... Um, of course, it's not something that I personally would do exactly. I'm not like good at scripts at all. <laughs> I'm mostly I mostly draw and animate uh, for people. And um, what I'd say it's difficult for starting the project. It's um, getting the character, the proportions right. Um, it's it's not always gonna be gonna work out on my art style or. Um, sometimes the client doesn't like it and of course I have to uh, move stuff around so I can make it work and um, for example spinning the character around in a circle (laughs) or something is always like the most difficult task Uh, especially if if it's um, like a full body it's not easy to draw the character for example each limb or the whole body in the exact same proportion as before sometimes like the animation could be like one to ten seconds or five seconds and the anatomy can change a lot in in that time um what else i think that's mostly what's most difficult for me okay hold on drown the point i think ram you're the last one right yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, I uh, I'm also not exactly much of a uh, script writer. I like I want to write scripts and do stories and stuff eventually, but uh, the big thing is I make very short form content. So obviously, while there is script writing involved, I'm making jokes. A lot of my stuff isn't really script writing unless I'm working with like I'm Shadow or something to you know voice for me. That's the main time I'm usually writing a script for my content. Um. Most of the time, I just, the harder part is mentally storyboarding everything because I don't, since my content's so short, I don't really worry about making a whole long storyboard, but I kind of have to have an idea of what I want things to look like in my head. And so doing that is a little bit hard and trying to set up the scene, you know, like the environments and the lighting can be very time consuming and getting the lighting just right has always been a bit of a struggle for me. Um, But once I get going... I, things do tend to get a bit easier. Like thinking of ideas of how I'm going to make a scene work becomes a lot easier once I start working on the project more and more. Um, and another hard thing though is like a big part of short form animation content is I have to do a lot in a short amount of time 
to actually leave an impact compared to a longer project, a longer project where there's a lot more time for the actual impact of the project to set in. If I want people to actually remember my animations, I have to like be like, I have to really like hammer in the jokes or the whatever happens in the actual animation itself uh, really hard. So people just, you know, just don't forget about it. Cause you know, I make content that's usually about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, on a slightly bigger project, like my, like the iron lung, uh, pro remake trailer project, um, honestly, the hardest part for something like that, which actually applies to some other projects too, is how the hell am I actually going to make this work? And what I mean is, is SS eh, SFM is not exactly made to make an ocean of blood or dripping liquids and stuff like that. Um, trying to make that work in SFM is extremely difficult, but because I'm trying to make a recreation of a, our very like, you know, abstract artistic trailer I kind of need to keep all the little details like that. And so trying to make that actually work in a, a format like SFM can be rough because I can tell you that project crashed on me uh, just nonstop. It was constantly crashing because SFM does not like liquids very much. Um, and finally, along with that, I would say the biggest thing that's like a harder to like actually, you know, do with starting a project is I guess kind of just trying to make the camera angles look natural because a lot of the time, characters are going to be, whenever you want them to do specific poses, um, it's going to look like some absolutely horrible, genuine body horror kind of stuff in 3D. Like, like genuinely, it looks horrifying a lot of the time. But the thing is, is if you have the right camera angle, no one's going to see that. That's the point of camera, like working with the camera, is you make it look very natural, even though if you move that camera just a little bit, you're going to see Twilight's head like stretched away from her body and her arms stretched everywhere. But if you have the right camera angle, it's going to just look like she's like holding her hoof up or something and she's looking a certain way. Like it looks completely normal. But making that work is kind of hard. But you know, it's a big part of, like, 3D animation is, is you're going to be making the characters do very abnormal movements and stuff like that and trying to make them look normal. Okay. So, next question. Um, for We're, we're going to do some of the ones that I, I seem to ask every single um, Create a Roundup. Um, for those that are trying to get into animation either for the first time or maybe trying to try something new. Um, what is y'all's advice for them? Um, I'm going to start with Cole. Oh, perfect. No, this is actually good. Cause like I'm speaking as someone who's very new to the like animation, animation side of things. And like, cause if, if you saw part one of, uh, of journey, there was a thing in the beginning where like, Oh, there actually is like a, a simple but still a traditionally animated uh, like memoria thing going on there. And that was something that I never in a million years thought I would be able to do. I figured I would never I would never touch the uh, the, the the iPad apps that do the such things. Uh, I figured oh, I just I can't do that because I don't know how to draw and I'm just never going to. But I really wanted it to be in the video. So I worked for it and I tried and I made something happen. Um, so it's like, it, it's kind of like in Ratatouille with the whole anyone can cook kind of thing where it's like, you know, uh, there are lots of things that you're going to look at and you're going to think, oh man, I just can't do that because I can't do this, this, and this, and this. But because I think, uh, you get really focused on like, like the best of the best, and like your end goal rather than what you can currently do. Essentially, because uh, you can have this crazy, crazy animation idea where the camera's flipping around and people are having anime battles, and and you know, there's just uh, you're animating liquids and fire and lasers and all these things. But like, that is that's for the future. You know, you gotta build up to that. You gotta start. Simple. So that's what I did. I said, I am going to take my character. She's going to go from looking forward to looking up. And that's all I said I wanted to accomplish. And I managed to make it happen. So set those small goals in the beginning. Don't get so caught up in, oh my goodness, I'm a new animator. And I want to animate a, a flying camera shot with dragons 
and monkeys. Like that's not going to happen. You gotta, you gotta keep it simple in the beginning. So that's, that's <laughs> you just gotta Fran- keep it simple. That's what was that? Fran- that's an- that's something Francis would do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, One yeah, day so he will be on here. <laughs> if you're if you're beginning, start simple. Um, know your limits. Understand that you you will probably surprise yourself if you actually put the effort in. And uh, yeah, definitely just don't. In the words of way too many people, don't give up. Yeah, that that is definitely one that I hear quite often. Good piece of advice, though. Um, E.G., you're next. Ah, perfect. Uh, this is also going back to uh, about challenges, also, because because uh, uh, the advice I'm going to give and give to people is uh, it will be a bit challenging, but it but the uh, but the um, it, it, but the process uh, is worth it. But it's worth the process. Uh, if if animators, if beginner animators want to start doing 2D animation, like hand drawn animation, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's a digital flash, a uh, uh, like a hand like legit physical hand paper or anime style i would suggest practicing life drawing a la- life drawing and anatomy because that is gonna help you build uh uh build a i would say a memory uh, yeah muscle memory and also uh building a blueprint for you uh, as you start discovering your own animation style yeah, that's uh a huge one yeah, like anatomy is a very anatomy and consistency is very challenging for two D animation because you got because like when when one shot cuts to another, you're gonna see uh, the character being drawn differently, like the portions are off or the uh, or the face or the face is off, uh, and you just see like oh man, and like it, it, this might hurt people with OCD too. <laughs> <laughs> and even for me, even for me, I uh, I look back at my older animations and I'm like, yeah, I I should really really start doing more and uh, more uh, drawing anatomy more often. Which is, it's always important to just go out and just draw uh, people, animals, a- any kind, and turn things around with your own art style to make it look uh, to make it look at least um, uh, well adjusted to animate. And but it's also therapeutic. Like once you get the hang of learning uh, an ana- anatomy and, and life drawing it, it before you start animating, it does make you feel more motivated to animate. It, it c- and there are many other animators out there, even in the indie in the indie scene, who will say the same thing that it that um that the process is it, it is like. The best mountain climbing uh, adventure you can you can you can reach. It will start challenging in, in the fir- at your first attempt, but it, it but it gets less and less difficult when, if if you keep it up. Like and and I'm not saying do it every day because I don't want I don't want a beginner animators to burn it to burn out easily. Just find a limit. Just find a limit that uh, that what makes you inspired and what you want to draw, and then animate it. And and there you go. And and like Cole said, just Start simple. Just take it step by step. So, yeah. Brim, your turn. <clears throat> All right. So, I also, similarly to Cole, I'm a little bit newer to the animation type of stuff. Like, I've only been doing it for about a year now. So, it's actually kind of a question I, I feel like I'm actually pretty, gone, pretty good on giving a bit of my perspective on. Um, so, honestly... I really think one of the biggest things is early on, this is going to be from the perspective of, you know, a 3D animator who doesn't make his own models or anything like that. So let's just say that you're wanting to start off SS- eh, SFM specifically. Uh, I decided to study up a bit, but not too much. What I did is, is I watched a bit of an Argo Damon live stream just to get me started on how to actually, like, you know, animate. I wanted to figure out how SFM worked and all that and what I should do. And in that live stream... He actually made a suggestion of like making lots of still images first before you actually get into the animation side of things. And that that helped me a lot. It was crazy because I was making images that looked insane to me. I was like super happy. I was like, I never thought I could have made something like, you know, actually, you know, just this is an image I made. This is a thing I made that you know actually has my own little storyline going on in this one image. 
and that was really cool. Using that is a like making still images is a good way to learn how you actually pose characters, which you're going to be doing a lot of. Posing is a big part of animation, and to be completely honest with you, it is actually one of the harder parts of animation a lot of the time, in my opinion. Um, so it helps to start out with that, especially because it familiarizes you with the actual app itself, and you actually start knowing how to like do little tricks and stuff like that. And yeah. And eventually, you know, whenever I actually animate, I like I made all those stills and stuff. I think like two months later, I actually started animating. And I'm going to be honest, one thing you should expect is going to probably look pretty bad. But at the same time, you're probably going to be happy with just making anything at that point. Because you keep in mind, you're just learning. You're just starting out. And what you make is going to, you know, be crazy just for you at the time. Because it's like, wow, I can actually make that character move on the screen. And... I, I like don't worry about if it's going to look bad or not very likely it is that's just how things work when you're first learning but just keep making things that will make you proud is how I feel like you know you want to keep improving I've you know made animation for about a year now and I've made stuff that I would have never believed just over a year ago I could have made I would have been like I made that that that's like something you would actually expect from like a quality like animator in the fandom to make like that that blew my mind whenever I was able to start making stuff like that um, as you keep getting better and better, there is a bit of a downside, which is you're going to get slower and like, you're going to get technically, you could probably make something you made before in the exact same way, really fast, but that's not the point. You want your stuff to look better. You want the movements to be a bit more precise. You want things to actually look natural and you're going to know how to do that better. Now problem is, is you're going to be a little slower now because you're going to have to actually make sure stuff looks good. And well, there are some people who don't really focus on the improvements of animation and they don't really, you know, care about that time kind of thing. If you do want that, to, you know, if that is a focus of yours. If you want to really start improving and making things look better, you're going to have to start pushing yourself. And what I mean, by, like, you know, don't rush stuff for no reason. If you want your stuff to really impact people, then putting time and effort in goes a very long way. If you push yourself to do things that you haven't done before, you're going to start getting better. That's just, you know, you're learning new things. That's the whole point. Don't just stick with the things you find comfortable whenever you're learning animation. Do things that are uncomfortable to do so that way you learn more. Um, just to give an example, I mentioned like long form content and like, you know, like, uh, like not long form, sorry. I mentioned like, you know, faster videos before compared to like, you know, videos that take more time. I have a video that has about, like, 80k views. The pro the thing is, though, it has very little likes and very little comments. It was the first animation I ever uploaded on YouTube. Uh, it was made in about four hours. It doesn't look that good. Compared to a video that has 10k views in comparison, its likes and comments are much, 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 much higher. Because that video had a lot more put into it, which, you know, then made it had a much bigger impact on the audience. Okay. Was that all you had to say? Uh, yeah, for now. Okay. Ali Chan, your turn. Almost forgot I was muted. Um, well, I agree with everything that y'all have said already. Um, like, for, like, to take your time, practice, and, of course, don't, um, don't push yourself. Uh, I mean, not push yourself. I mean, push yourself, but don't you have a limit so you have to know your limits for um to start up with animation and um let's see um if you're starting up with for example you did a small animation whatever i whatever you like share it so you can get opinions i'd say that's a really uh that would really help a lot um for example in my case i started um showing my art or my animations in social media or my to my friends to my to my uh, my family and each one of them say oh some of them could say like oh cool <laughs> and that's all or some other people could just say oh look i, I like this i like the other like uh, or sometimes people compare it <laughs> to other art and um that may hurt a little bit but actually sometimes it does help to get opinions like that um, depending on, on you, of course. And um, I'd say you you can join communities, order artists um, that possibly like the same stuff as you. Um, 
like for example i draw cats so i, I join another community that draws cats and have friends <laughs> like that and um we all draw together from time to time and we can see each other's drawings and it's like it's pretty cool it's it's nice to have a community and you can learn from each other and also um if you want to start a project either big or small you have to of course plan in advance and be super organized and um we with um with a schedule of from what time to time you're going to um what's it called you're going to animate for example or um taking breaks and um and trying to not compare yourself to others that that's a big one <laughs> that i had trouble with it for a long time with it um but once you start improving it it just you can start loving your art more and more than comparing yourself yeah just yeah gonna say it must, it's got to be one of the two most difficult ones to not try comparing yourselves to with art and animation yeah it is mm -hmm. anywho vincent your turn I got a two for one. One I'm glad I learned earlier, uh, and one oh, I wish I learned earlier. It, it, so, it, it, so for the first one, the, Minty, the main Minty, Minty. Minty. Yeah. It, it's Vincent's turn. Oh, I misheard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Minty was so it's ready, okay. he's just off to the races. Anyway, your turn, Vincent. <laughs> the races. No, no, it's fine. Um, let's see. And to recap the question, that was uh, advice for beginners, basically? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I will chime in on, you know, two, two uh, prompts that people brought up. Like, definitely the first one of pacing yourself. I mean, I've animated for on and off for probably, like, what, 10 years as a hobby? And I still have to remind myself not to burn out, because... People underestimate the amount that goes into production, especially if you're a one-man team. So, not only do you have to find things that uh, motivate you, but you also need to find ways to recharge, and that can look different for everybody. But, long story short, you really want to uh, find a balance between work and, you know, what's not work, what you enjoy. Because your hobby can very quickly turn into another job, because technically it is work. You're expelling a lot of brain power, probably, it could maybe even more or less than if you have a day job as well. So, it's very easy to, you know, spend a lot of hours and then days on end, and, you know, I've discovered as human beings we're not meant to sit in front of a computer screen 24-7. Ideally, we shouldn't. <laughs> that we need social balance, we need to take care of ourselves, we need to be somewhat active, and, you know, I have to set myself reminders constantly for little things, like, I don't know, vitamin D or chores, or I need to pay this bill, like, that sort of thing. Like, vitamin it, D, I can relate to vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? That's what happens when you don't go outside enough, kids. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> what? What's the sun? We're all vampires here. <laughs> We're all vampires here. Oh, man. But, no, definitely take care of, your, care of yourself and find a balance. I'm trying to remember the second point. It was inspired... Rem, it was inspired by your comment. I'm trying to jog... I'm trying to jog what you were saying. I remembered most of it. But, uh... Oh, shoot. What was it? Rem, are you here? Can you... Uh, uh, what was your quick summary of what you were what you said oh, wait what was this oh boy what, <laughs> what was, what was what the question that we just talked about uh the, the question we just talked about uh <laughs> my brain is dumb what was it oh, that's okay and, no it was advice for beginner animators oh uh well uh the big thing about what i talked about was basically well okay i'm trying to think of like a quick way to summarize that uh so I was saying that, you know, I was new to it, and so I actually studied stills and stuff like that, and along with studying stills, I, like, I, like, actually made stills, and I tried saying, like, you know, work with that first, then start moving on to, like, actual animation, and then, 
uh, you know, it looked really bad at first, but you know, it's fine. You should just, you know, you, you can accept it's going to look bad because you know, it's, it's still cool just to see that you made something move. And then at some point your animations are going to start getting more natural, but it's also going to start getting slower. That's the big good. thing about that is you want to push yourself to like, you know, harder and harder. Perfect. Thank you. That, that, that was it. Yeah, no. Um, I was going to say to add to that point that you absolutely should study how people not only how people behave in real life but how cartoons tend to interpret people in real life because you're going to get vast well in the stylized field you can get a million different ways like you in anime they work with very slower frame rates and basic movements so they're just talking they might get more robust in their action sequences or you know even shows like fim with their puppets have a certain type of animation then you get to things like Star Wars The Clone Wars and you get like more elaborate 3D animations and long story short, there's a lot of different animation styles because you know every animator has their own style. But if one of them motivates you or if you find something that's a great inspiration, study how how that works. Because I maybe took like one animation class um in college. And yes, my college degree does say a, a um, game development animation both to graphics, but I don't technically do animation. I, I self-taught myself, more or less, and the way you do that is, yeah, we studied the 12 basic principles of animation, that's where most things start, but from there, over the more think times you do animation and observe it, you get kind of a natural instinct to what looks right like the amount of bounce or squash and stretch or what would this character do if they were feeling this way it's study how that behaves in real life in cartoons even in video games there's a crap ton of inspiration like media that you can just watch and absorb and kind of get a sense for how people express themselves because body language and face says a lot do you mind basically. if i answer that real fast uh, uh that's fine I yeah i just wanted to add real fast you actually reminded me of something that i forgot to say which is uh, I made an animation called Element of Brutal Honesty, and that animation is the first one where I was very happy with my lip sync and like just my characters being like like idols in general. And what I did to actually figure out how to do stuff like that was I put on an Argo Damien animation, I put it at the lowest speed possible, and watched it. I watched yep. how he made the characters move. I watched how he made the characters. Because yeah. I learned that characters have little subtle details. Like, every little movement, there's always like a lot going on that yeah, you don't realize. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're trying to mimic, like, you know, I think I said earlier, like, Sonata is one of the main characters. What, well, actually, on... on Twitter, like my socials, I had a, I made a little animated show where it's like, oh, you choose your character for the video game, and she and she like jumps up and she claps, and that was directly based off of um, a GIF of what Sonata did in Equestria Girls, where she gets excited about something and she kind of like pushes her hips back and she kind of clasps her hand together. It's very particular animation. I use that as a basis because like that's how she acts. But because I can't emulate fist bumps with her little flipper hoof things, I kind of just translated that to, oh, a little clap. Like a cute little clap, and that's what she does. And so it was kind of a mixture of, yeah, like like uh, Rem was saying, you study reference, and then I kind of just improv based on the limitations or uh, design of the rig. And sometimes I have to do, like, frame-by-frame -frame slowdowns of particular animations just to kind of mimic something, so... But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Okay, Minty, now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, so one of the things uh, that, that I usually, usually don't want to bring up, because one of the things lots of people want to learn about anime... Basically, they will go to tutorials, they're going to see how other animators... Uh, learn they you know they'll go the the basic kit they'll all learn along the way about the 12 principles of animation the the animation survival guide uh all of that in terms of resources most people already know about or at least they will get to learn about it along their way one of the things i recommend to uh, to people who are starting an animation something i really wish i realized much earlier is that animation is not just about learning animation it's about learning all sorts of things that you don't even realize that are, have to do with animation 
for example, learning about low budget filmmaking. So you know what to do when you have not a lot of budget, not a lot of things you can do with characters. Uh, learn how to, for example, some filmmakers manage to pull off some things with like maybe a thousand dollars in an old film camera that they had. Get to learn about uh, artistic currents that were uh, that you wouldn't really see that much in animation, but could inspire you. You could learn, for example, about a painter everybody hated that was super influential and everybody hated, not just because he cheated on his wife. Uh, get to learn things that don't even have to do with art, but can inspire you with stories. For example, get to learn, um, just for example, um, uh, signal processing. Learn a bit how uh, you can clean up noise because it can really, really, really help with 3D renders when you know a bit what you're doing. Uh, get to learn about just watching documentaries that could give you really cool ideas. For example, missing out a lot of it just came down to me reading and watching lots of documentaries about uh, film restoration and just the idea of the way that I did the uh, the holographic tree of harmony it was just inspired by reading about how uh, Harmy did this despecialized edition of Star Wars by basically just patching together a couple of different versions together to try to get the best version of what could have been the original version of the scene before the special effects were added in. And just learning how he did this process inspired me so much just visually, just because he showed a bit this process with that, even though that barely has anything to do with animation. Uh, I learned, I watched a couple of documentaries, and right now I'm working a script on a project. And one of the inspirations is a documentary about scientific fraud, and it's about witches. So it's a pretty weird mix. And you think, well, it doesn't have anything to do with it. I'll figure out a way to make it work. And that's one of the things with animation. Uh, when you create world, you create something that's completely different. Uh, you can't really just, and lots of people will do the mistake. They'll say, they'll look at something that already exists and say, well, I'm going to do it like that. And one of the problems is that you just get the kind of generic kind of things that people dislike animation for. And uh, so I really recommend like learn all of that, learn how filmmakers work, even live action, for example, the way that they do. Uh, camera pans, they all the crazy techniques to make it work, the way to do, do editing, because animation is also about editing, because you need to make things flow together. And the thing is that live action is pretty good at making things flow when you do it right, because they have to work with clips that they had to film, and they had to pre-plan all of those clips. Uh, and animation, you don't need that kind of, well, you have the pre-planning, but you don't have to have to set it up in person, like you do with live action. So just learning about their techniques, their approach, it can be very, very helpful to learn about how you can pull it off. And I learned so much just about how the um, how some live action directors manage to pull off some stuff. Uh, for example, the, their use of insert shots, their use of, of uh, cinematic techniques just to pull off those visions. It's very, very helpful. And none of that that I learned from animation guides because uh, the only thing, well, they will teach you how to make characters move. They'll teach you how to use software, and that's great. And don't tell, I don't want to tell people to avoid that because that's not worth it to to try to avoid that. All I'm saying is that you're going to learn all the ways to do animation, but if you only learn nothing but animation and nothing else, you'll get something very shallow, and it won't really help your process out in the long run. So that's my recommendation. I wanted to say, uh, on the subject of like inspiration, just kind of coming from very specific places, one of the biggest things for me has like has literally nothing to do with uh, like visual media at all. It's actually just it's been like roller coasters and like theme parks. Um, so like I remember it was like something in one of my PMVs where I wanted to recreate not necessarily the visual, but like the feeling that I got when I was at one of these places and I was like, how do I do this? And what I was, so it, it, it is true how like inspiration is going to come when you least expect it. So you got to like live life for that. And you can't just be like, I'm going to go watch a bunch of movies and get inspired. Cause that might not happen. You got to actually, yeah. the best inspiration is going to be the things that naturally happen, not on purpose. So that's the big thing you got to remember. Yeah. I, I actually have to agree with that as a writer. Um, mm -hmm. one of the uh, projects that I'm going to be working on here soon that 
it, it it popped up because I was at a convention and camera stopped working. And that was the entire inspiration for the story. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, yeah. I mean, because it's like you look at a lot of stories and like the a lot of stories are uh, um, in, uh, are inspired by like tragic events. Um, and I don't think that these are people trying to force tragic events to happen to them so they can have an interesting story because that would be psychotic. Um, but like, that's, that's all, that's life. That's living, you know, life has its fair share of tragedies and I I think forcing that to happen is going to be problematic. So don't do that. (laughs) Yeah. Don't, don't pull, um, don't pull, uh, probably in an, uh, something like in the movie adaptation. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. actually, actually i wanted to add something as well, movie, like inspiration out of nowhere oh sorry even though that movie is a really good really good uh um uh, really good video and uh, movie to watch for people who uh dealing with writer's block or lacking inspiration yeah i've heard about that movie and i was really? gonna add to cole's thing as well to this whole thing too is uh i made an animation that uh literally the whole point was I, I had like a series. I was basically trying to make a series of characters getting booped, but I wanted it to be more of a joke thing, not like a POV thing, because that's not my something I like personally. I wanted more of it to be like a goofy thing. And I remembered uh, I got inspired by Cole making a meme about meme. Um, yes, it was, it was uh, anthology. It was Markiplier like <laughs> raging over Twilight getting wings, and I decided. <laughs> You know what? My next animation is gonna be Pinky taking away Twilight's wings, and it's. I thought of that literally just because I saw a meme by Cole. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Like inspiration is gonna come from the goofiest places at times, so it's just all about uh, consuming stuff naturally, and again, not just being like, "Haha, I'm gonna go watch this movie because people said it's really good and it'll inspire me." Because that's that's not how it should be done. Well, uh, just the scene where you see Starlight showing how the door should open and uh, missing out. Is actually inspired by the stupidest anecdote I've been reminded of. Uh, when I was um, visiting my grandmother, it turns out that a friend of hers do, that recognized me when I was a kid, uh, she saw me and she she brought up the fact that the one thing she remembered of me was asking her how her wipers went. Like, would it, would the, the wipers just go opposite sides or would they would they go the same side on her cars? And it was, it, she was basically just miming it the way that I did it as a kid. <laughs> And just thinking that's so absurdly specific and just stayed in my mind and eventually just became that. So that's one of the things I really recommend. Like sometimes you're going to have very unique life experiences that, and the thing is that uh, one of the the things I've been told a lot is do not, uh, don't uh, mix your experience for cinema, but sometimes you're going to have something that's going to make it that's something that's going to make it very unique that comes from your personal experience that I recommend. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, that's one of those things like you, you're going to have a personal touch for your project, no matter what. So just embrace it. Okay. So before we uh, get to the next question, I'm going to remind everybody in the chats that are listening in on this. If you have questions for any of these guys, Feel free to post them in the chats, and we will get to them at the end. Um, I think the next question I'm going to preempt with, uh, remember that we may not have people that understand some of the, uh, because animation can have some very technical jargon. Um, So I I do ask that... uh, Don't worry, I'm the most layman's animator ever. I'm like, that's the doohickey that does the thing. Yeah, I, I just wanted to preempt that. Before I ask this one, um, so what is the most either technically impressive or technically complex thing that you guys have pulled off in your animation? Whether it, it looks benign or not, doesn't matter. Just it back end or front end, either way. Which, like, what is the most technical mm-hmm. thing you've gotten away with in your uh, animations? And uh, I'm gonna let EG go first. Ooh, I'm glad you. I'm glad you picked me first. The, I think the best uh, uh, technical level I uh, was able to pull off was, I think it was, uh, I think it was just the uh, the time I was able to make my very first animated short that got uh, that got accepted in multiple film festivals, which is my Sparky the Hummingbird animation uh, called uh, "Follow the Mountain." 
And um, and this project, uh, really, I got inspired from um, uh, from a lot of live events that I went to, like when I was on vacation, uh, Yosemite Valley, uh, but also Napa Valley. No, not Napa Valley. Wait, was it Napa? No, not Napa. It was a uh, Palm Springs. And during Palm Springs and spring break and 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 during my spring break in in high school, I actually uh encountered this uh little yellow hummingbird, and um and, and he was like flying so close to me. And like it felt like I, I, he and I were about to bond before my parents called in and then they just flew away. And that gave me the idea to create this little guy. And it, he became my mascot for my own animation studio. And it received it, two awards for it in two different film festivals for uh, best animated film and best director and audience choice. Um, and it was like the best moment of my life four years ago. And the story itself is just like, it, it's just, I didn't put so much focus on animation, but I focused so much on background painting and of course, Sparky, because I love, I, it's easier for me to animate uh, animals than I am to humans. <laughs> uh, but I am getting there. I am getting there at, 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 uh, at, at drawing and animating humans more often. Um, but creating a Sparky the Hummingbird his uh, symbolism is ba and its themes is basically the smallest things. Anything that's so small as a hummingbird will keep you going. And they represent and they represent positivity. They represent guidance to uh, to a brighter future for you. And and making that symbolism was like one of the best things I've ever done, animation wise. And I've been able to experiment a lot with with him and. And I got to um, uh, replicate the the multiplane camera animation. Like, you, if anyone remembers the movie Bambi, how the movie starts, where you're exploring the forest. I love Bambi. Like that, for example, I was able to replicate the multiplane camera movement in in, in, uh, in Toon Boom. Uh, I I took I spent at least four weeks painting a a a, a detailed as possible um, a, a painting of a forest with enough detail to look at it layer by layer. And I just had Sparky hum is uh, Sparky uh, flying and uh, flying around the forest. Uh, uh, just to test the, the limits of, of the multiplane move and movement. And I was just so satisfied how it, uh, how it ended up afterwards. And so, yeah, like don't be afraid to experiment uh, with your animations. Like uh, uh, just, um, just don't alienate yourself from your, from your idea, from your story. Uh, uh, but you can also like uh, give give it give it something that would that would uh, feel attached to your uh, to your idea like something experimental that uh, that would just be memorable uh, to look at. So yeah, uh, those um those are all I could say. Oh yeah, uh, uh, one another thing to uh, also mention like um yeah like uh, 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 experimenting with. Compositions of animation is like one of the best ways you can you can uh, grab uh, ideas and also inspire future artists of what they can do. Okay, Rem. All right, so I actually touched upon this a little bit already, but my most technically impressive thing I've done by far was my uh, Iron Lung trailer animation thing inspired by, uh, you know, Markiplier's trailer, trailer. And to be completely honest, it was a challenge. Like I said, it crashed a lot. And the thing is, it's because I had to make, you know, an ocean of blood. And SFM really does not like liquids. I'm sure at least, I know Vincent's worked with uh, SFM as well a bit, so I'm sure he, he can attest that SFM really does not like liquids very much. And... Yeah. yeah. And so I also did dripping blood, which is very, very hard to do. Um, I learned very quickly oh, oh, liquids that drip. Oh, those are actually hard to do in animation. You never think about it, but it's very <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> um, and it was it was rough like it, it was honestly very hard and i actually making them look realistically like they're actually dripping off like you know like you have subtle details like i had to work with a million like teardrop models to actually make it look good and so like you'd see like it would be literally another model would start like 
coming off of it. And, you know, you'd have to make it like, you know, shrink and move in the right way. And, and when, you know, liquids, when they drip they're it's constant movement. It's never just still. So you have to actually like, you know, focus on that. You know, you got to make the liquid move like subtly a little bit the entire time it's like moving. And it's, it was a whole process making that work. Um, it is definitely the hardest thing I've done. And like, just think about like when Twilight was like, like rising up from the ocean of blood, like, you know, she was covered in it. So it's just this giant layer of it, just like dripping off of her mane, dripping off her body. And that took a lot of time and a lot of effort. And while this was a little less technically uh, difficult, I did also have to like retexture Twilight, like blood red. I had to like make her mane more uh, like blood red, like... I had to, like, tint her eyes a little bit red because, you know, she was literally inside a blood ocean and her eyes opened up before she actually fully got out. So, you know, her eyes are going to be covered in it, too. Um, and just trying to make all the subtle camera movements look right and all the, like, lighting look correct compared to, like, the trailer that Markiplier made, that was very difficult, especially the lighting. The lighting is, uh, SFM's lighting is kind of crap. Uh... Uh, what I'm basically I'm saying is, is SFM is a great point to start from, but a lot of SFM is crap and very hard to work with because SFM doesn't want to do what you want it to do. And so you have to figure out how to make things work. Because again, there's not just a blood model you can look up on SFM's workshop. There's technically there is, but it, it is literally just, oh, this is like a texture on that, like a blood texture for walls and stuff like that. Or like, Oh, I can make it look like a, a steel image of a character getting shot or more like more cartoony, which, you know, I'm animating a cartoon thing, but I wanted the blood to actually look good because it was a very artsy, like abstract trailer based off of, you know, Mark's Markiplier's trailer. So I had to actually work with that instead. And since it had to be more, abstract and artsy i couldn't just be oh cartoon uh blood popping off no that wouldn't work and so that was definitely the hardest thing and most technically impressive thing i've made and i'm sad that it kind of didn't do the best viewership wise but at the same time you know i'm just i'm actually really happy with it no matter what anyways because i've had a lot of people actually tell me that was like one of the best things i've made and looks super good and i'm like very happy that that's what it being ended up being the case is that a lot of people who actually did see the animation agree it is probably the best animation I've ever made. Okay. Vincent, your turn. Ooh. Well, I don't want to bring up anything that I'm currently working on because that's all under wraps. And I have made some good achievements back then. I think for, since this question, I'm going to rewind. Um, because one of the things I admire is probably one of my older animations and my most popular one on the channel that I made back in 2016 called The uh, Misadventures of Applejack the Vampire Slayer. And I'm not only impressed that I was able to make, I think, consistently um, flowing humor in that one, but the other thing I'm impressed with was that I was able to sync up the music tracks um, and edit the music tracks and make it flow with the animation like flawlessly. And that is because I used a soundtrack from an existing cartoon and also like independent songs. Um, the composer I used was uh, Gordon Goodwin and he has like a jazz band. He has a modern one. And the soundtrack I used was from a, a Looney Tunes special that he composed for. So the, already the soundtrack was kind of already built for cartoon cues. Like, back in the 1950s when, you know, they debuted Looney Tunes in, like, theaters, oftentimes the soundtrack would reflect whatever's happening on screen. Like, they would have the horns or the violins, and it would very much mimic what was going on in the scene. I wanted to do that, but with the jazz soundtrack. And so, if, you, if, if any of y'all ever go back and watch it, it's... I'm still impressed. It's like, man, I was able to splice together and find just the right soundtracks to where it felt like it was made for that animation. But in reality, it wasn't. Um, so a lot of audio, and, not, and I'm not an audio mixer by far. And that, and to add to an earlier, way earlier point that Mindy said that you know you learn more things. It's that's another thing: editing and sound effects, like all those stuff, go into animation as well. So for. A seven-year-old animation using my first program, like a, a technically like a very low standards program, um, I was impressed with that. And I guess, actually I'll add to that, 
The other thing I've been impressed is that I had the patience to green screen every single shot in that animation because all the characters were animated to Miku Miku Dance, which is like a Japanese animation program. And then I basically went into Gary's Mod, uh, dressed up the sets, and then I would take photos of them. And then, you know, sometimes I would go into Photoshop and like, oh, I'm going to put a poster on the wall that otherwise just would not work in Source because, you know, as Ram said, SFM is kind of picky and it's a 20-year-old engine. And if you want a good example of that, my good friend uh, Mario Travel 209, who made um, a Saxe Award nominee of uh, The Art of Justice, um, would also constantly, like, he had 20 lights in, in the scene, and it would crash constantly. Like, Source is not built for that. It's a 20-year-old engine. So it definitely has its limitations. But in spite of that, I was able to work around it and kind of embrace the stylization. So... I would definitely say that was probably one of my more impressive bits, and that's also probably one of my longer animations, too. So, I'm still proud of that one, even if some of the animations are a bit more dated and not as good. Okay. Allie Chan. Um, so, it's, um, what was the question again? The most technically difficult and impressive, what, what have you, uh, animation you've done so far? Thing that you're most proud of? Hmm. Technical. I mean, I've done technical stuff. Uh, I do most of the time, but mostly it's um my own. What's it called? My own growth. Like for example, the anatomy and animation lip syncing, and um. That's mostly like uh, what's it called? Um, uh, muscle memory. Um. Something I've noticed lately is um, that I have been animating faster um, because I animate by hand and it's the practice has made me better than before <laughs> and I can I can do things more quickly and um, I feel like I do uh, body movements more realistically accurate and that's something I'm very proud of. Uh, at the moment, for example, within a a project I'm working on right now, which I can show, I cannot show, <laughs> but uh, it has a lot of body movement that I'm really proud of. And um, but aside of that, the more technically technically stuff would be um, that I export my animation and import it into After Effects, and sometimes I play with it. I don't know whatever I can do in After Effects. Um, there was this one time that I had a college assignment that I had to, um, I think it was like one of the final assignments. And I had this idea to combine footage and my animations. And I, like I, like I said, I exported my animation from, I use Clip Studio Paint and I, I mean, ported it in After Effects, and I used one of my footage. And um, what I did is, the footage is like a river, a river, a really flowing, constantly river. And I put my my character in the middle, in the middle of the river, and somehow I had to cut it or make it, make it seem like my character was wet or in the water, and I managed to. Uh, replicate re replicate the liquid that I mean the river going through the character that I was very proud of and I actually don't remember how to do it because it was just this one time but um that's when the practice come um I have to practice more to remember um that situation that um what's it called the progress of that project and um, I also had to do the reflection of the character in the water, in the river, which was nice. And it, it looked a bit choppy, but, you know, it works. It's practice. And, yeah. Okay. Minty. 
So for a while, I would have probably replied uh, the sequence where you have Celestia on the top of the balcony in the fall of Sunset Shimmer, because the whole idea was that it was 25 seconds long, a long extended shot where the camera would be flying in, uh, first going up, then following Celestia, and then doing a 180 as she reacted as the sun would go down. And the sequence was quite tricky because I had to figure out how to match the perspective. And the trick I had back in the days was I'm going to make the most basic 3D rig as the scale reference and then animate Celestia on top of it. And uh, when it came to missing out, I built a tool to synchronize a camera to make sure that I could actually have in Toon Boom a 3D camera that could fly around. And then I could just synchronize it with Blender to just render a very pretty looking 3D background all around it. So you think, oh, uh, that's it. I don't have to worry anymore about doing that kind of synchronization. And for a while, it was the tr truth uh, until I did that one shot where you see uh, in Missing Out, you have a sequence where you have uh, Starlight, who's about to go inside the, the Golden Lump Library as Pinky is opening the door. And that sequence was quite a challenge because the whole thing, you had, uh, you had to use the, the camera synchronization to have uh, basically just have the camera just flying from inside or well, from outside to inside. And one of the things is that I needed to have Starlight to, to work with that proxy rig to get a good idea of the perspective. I had to figure out a way to actually make the Golden Wolf Library work both for the inside and the outside, because if you look at the show and you look at how big it is on the inside and how small it is on the outside, none of it makes sense. So I had to figure out a camera angle where I could be able to actually hide um, the elements to make it look like it was the proper scale. And then I had to figure out a weird, really, really weird way to actually layer things. Uh, so one of the tricks I did is that technically I just cut out the front of the Golden Book Library. I stitched a part of the inside uh, to be able to be visible from that perspective. I put a hold out with that part that's technically outside. So I could actually put a card with a render of Ponyville behind. I had to animate the door, and the whole idea is that the door is animated in 3D, but the characters are in 2D. So I had to sync it up with the animation, and I had to make a massive crowd behind Binky that would be there just talking. And I do feel like the crowd itself is not the best, but uh, one of the limitations with Toon Boom is that having that many instances of one character in there is a nightmare. And I had to figure out a way to make those crowds cast shadows in 2D, so I had to build a really weird tool, and the whole idea is mostly just skews towards the camera. And the problem is skewing. Uh, you can only skew it uh, horizontally or vertically. So I had to figure out a way to actually make it work with Toon Boom. And the whole idea was uh, rotate by 90 degrees, skew, scale, and then rotate back. And basically just had to figure out that approach. I had to figure out how to layer everything with the 3D render, because the whole idea is that Pinky was behind the door. Uh, so I had to basically just render a Z-Depth map and then use a ramp and actually animate it. So she would always be at the right place in Z-Depth. I had to comp the shadows because Starlight would be uh, casting a shadow on the ground. So I had to figure out a way to make it work. And then the, yeah, the compositing, making it look pretty as well because the Golden Look, look, uh, the Golden look Library is a pretty complex model uh, when you model that kind of thing because it's not something that's based on a simple geometric shape. I basically had to go uh, take the shape that you already had in the show and actually build out of it uh, something that looked good in 3D with that kind of model. And uh, then I had to texture that. So I think that would be mo my most complex shot so far. I have some pretty ambitious things for my next project, but I can't really talk much about it without going to spoilers. So I think I'm going to go with that one. OK. And call. All right, I'm happy that I'm going to last because I had to really think about this one. Um, so, like, this is... I don't know. Okay. So my answer is a little different. It's not really a specific shot. It's not really a specific thing that I did. It's more of the project as a whole kind of thing. And I want to talk specifically about the concept of momentum. In a, in a thing, whatever is the animation, a video, whatever, and how it matters to have not just good pacing, because that's like, that's a really basic way to put it, but having 
um, thematic and cinematic intentions behind the momentum of what is happening. And I'm going to explain that as, in, is, as follows. Hang on. This is very, very difficult. He said, use layman's terms. And I'm sitting here like, oh, okay. Uh. Um, so there are scenes in Journey Part 1 where there's a lot of particles flying around and you know you might ask yourself well what's the point of this but there's always a story uh centric purpose behind every decision being made so if you look if you want examples where you look at this one scene where okay discord is here things are being a little kind of uh distorted because we're in like discord area but then main six get freed Okay, the particles are now the main six colors, but okay, now they're getting a green hue that's foreshadowing Chrysalis, and then we move into Chrysalis. So that's essentially the momentum of how these sequences play out, rather than just making pretty little things that that uh, that are neat to look at, but don't necessarily mean much and don't have again. It's the intentions of the uh, of the momentum of what you're doing whether or not the audience sees that is it's not irrelevant but it's not the most important thing because i feel like those things will subconsciously connect with people whether they realize it or not it's one of those things like in video editing and animating there there's this thing that i have always said like you're going to do a lot of work that people aren't going to notice but if you don't put that work in, they're going to notice that that work isn't there. Does that make sense? I mean, yes. Yeah, yeah pretty much. So, like, when I say about having intentions behind the momentum of something, that's obviously when one scene flows from the next or one thing flows from the next. It's how can you keep the momentum of a long-form video interesting and it's with having those purpose the purpose behind the particles i guess is a, a fun uh marketable way to say it i don't know um yeah i mean in short because i don't want to i don't want to go on for for too long it's just keeping the momentum of what i am doing uh feeling like there's always an intention behind it and not just a bunch of colors flying around purpose without purpose. That's the challenge. Um, and that's why it's hard to pick just a single, a single moment because it's all kind of parallel with each other and what the difficulty was. So it's just, yeah. If that was confusing, don't worry. I'm confused too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think for the next question, what we're going to do is wait for my lizards to quit trying to escape. Uh, for the next question, we're going to go ahead and do the what does y'all's creative process look like? Like, what do you start out with? And, like, how does how does your workflow normally go? Um, for this one, I think I'm going to start with Cole. Oh, boy, me again. Uh, well, again, Similar to kind of what I was just saying about like paying attention to the flow of the story and and all of that, uh, it all really begins w with this project specifically. It begins with the uh, with essentially what I want to do with the story, um, and uh, and again, it's all okay. How do I tell this story in a very, I guess, artsy fartsy way or whatever? Uh, because that's that's what I like to do. I like uh, I like. Not vague. Vague isn't the right word, because I feel like, you know, you can hide behind vague storytelling, and then people will see something, and it'll be like, hmm, yes, that's what I meant. I'm happy you noticed when you were just lying, and you just made a bunch of gobbledygook. Uh, <laughs> but I like, again, when you have the intention behind what you're doing, and you can see what other people are taking from it, that's kind of the thing that keeps me moving. Um, like, wondering, like, okay, when I put this thing out in the world, what are other people going to think? Because there's no, there's no, uh, like perfectly correct answers when it comes to art. I think people can see something in anything and it's a, it's a very humbling thing when someone 
looks at your work and they see something that maybe you weren't intending, but it means something to them. And I don't think as an artist, you should be taking that feeling away from them because <laughs> that's not what I meant. Like that's, I think it's a, it's a very important thing to have that, that connection to the audience that, Hey, you can look at this and believe in it, what you see. And that's the kind of thing that keeps me moving throughout my work. And it's this idea that, Oh, I'm going to make something. People are going to watch it and their interpretations are theirs and I'm not going to stop them. You know, you know, it's, it's one thing when it's bad. Like if someone sees my work and they're, and they're thinking that it's like some kind of insane, like conspiracy theory nonsense, then I'll, I'll shut that down because that's not the case. But when it's just, you know, I had somebody who came to me that said, um, something in the story that helped them get out of their art block which to me was insane that like I made something that brought someone else's uh, want. Like I made something that made someone else want to make art again. And that's crazy to me. Like I impacted someone's life like that just through making whatever it is that I made. And so like my creative process is always think about the story Consider how it's going to impact the people that view it and just make the thing. It's, it's a, it's a long, it's a long way to say a short sentence of make thing good. Be careful. People will watch. There you go. And get good. Get good. I know I sound like the ramblings of an insane person right now, but that's because oh, I am be a much worse person. I'm going to be much worse when it comes to insane ramblings in a second. <laughs> okay. Allie. Uh, well, for the pro the process, um, it really depends because um, I do my own projects and I do commissions or other projects in general. And um, of course, there's always like a, a script or a description of it. And I do my best to uh, to translate that script or description into a storyboard or animatic. I I mostly do like a sto mix of storyboard and animatic because I put it directly into the, the timeline. So I start sketching the animation and I like give it to the client or if it's just for me, I just like say cool it's good <laughs> and i just keep doing that until i get to the point that I, I feel like i can clean up or there's no other mistakes and um but basically yeah i do need like confirmation if everything is good if i can proceed if it's for a client and um i mostly work on characters so um after it doing a storyboard. I mean, it really depends if the character is really complex or not. But depending on that, I I practice the design or I translate it to my style. Um, that really is if the client wants my style or another style. So, um, And also, if it's from my own project, of course, I'm going to use my own art style. And um, I also do uh, color practice. Um, coloring the character or even a background just to see where how it fits um based on the script and um, and yeah i animate the character on one program i color the background on the same program but like another file and then i put it on the on the editing program which should be like premiere pro I mostly use Premiere Pro, <laughs> and um, I put it together. I, I would say that that'd be the most uh, easy part, or well, not easy, but the most um, fast part, um, because animated is just all by hand, frame by frame, and I, ha I have to check if everything is correct. It feels if it feels right, so that's the part that takes more time. And editing, it's it's mostly like uh, it's like a puzzle, putting things together and and seeing it all go pretty, and 
Yeah, let's see. Mm. Okay, Minty, your turn. So my uh, my creative process doesn't just happen in the void. Whenever you know, whenever you go with start, middle, end, the whole thing doesn't happen on its own. It's usually in parallel with another project. So right now, as I'm currently doing the animation for Project Under Cloud Remake, I'm currently working on a script for my next project. And the whole idea is that. Uh, one of the things I did realize is that I come up with my best ideas when I'm already working on an animation. So the whole idea is that uh, I'm basically just putting together ideas for what could be a very interesting animation while I'm working on another one. It's really helping me because sometimes when you have an animation you want to do, uh, you have some ideas that you want to put on that one, and it, it might just end up with some scope creep, something that's way too ambitious. So splitting it to something else just works. So the idea is that you come up with the ideas. Uh, you start writing at least a first draft of a script that you can actually show to people to give a good idea. Like, what would it look like in your head if you picture that? And would it be good? And if, it, if it's approved and I can get to run it through a couple of people first, and I get a couple of other drafts just to get it done, I can start doing the animatics. The whole idea with the animatics is mostly just me drawing the scenes in Flash in the most bare bones of a way, just to be able to have a good idea what kind of timing to, ex to, to expect, what kind of, um, uh, what kind of characters I'm going to need, uh, what are the going to be the limitations I'm going to have, because sometimes you have a very, very strict idea in your mind, but the thing is that your mind is not the best at showing how those things would play frame by frame. So just being able to put that on screen, even if it's the most rough drawing ever, really really helps and that way you can actually show it to people and tell them like this is my vision what do you think uh, and all ideas that you then start uh when you have the animatic you look at what you're, you're gonna need you can start building a background you can start building your rigs you don't need to complete the animatic yet uh to be able to start those steps because for example if my animation is double derpy i will know right away like i need to start a derpy rig and with that for example it's really helpful because with the derpy rig, I know exactly what I'm going to be able to pull off with that rig, and also I'm going to have, I'm going to be able to work and look at the animatic and see like what kind of things I'm going to need out of the rig with the animation that I have. So, for example, I realized when I was working in Project Under Cloud Remake that I have lots and lots of shots where derpy is just going to be gliding. The whole idea is that the the wing is supposed to be open, but I realized like the feathers are going to need to be split, and then you make them shake, so it really feels like the the wing is just open and it glides and the wind is actually affecting it. And it really helps. So uh, when it's, it's approved, I just complete the whole animatic. And the whole idea then is that I start, and sometimes I also do it in parallels with the script, but I start casting the voice actors. And sometimes some of them are the easiest to cast. Twilight Sparkle, just, just go with I'm Shadow. Like she's the one I will reserve for, for her. So that's the that's the most basic one. Sometimes it's going to be a bit tricky, so I might need to ask some people for their opinion. And sometimes I'm going to need to ask people like, "Do you think you'd be able to voice that character?" And then, um, and afterwards, you need I need to get the audio, the, the recording for those lines it can take a while. So sometimes what I'm going to do is that since I do a lot of scenes where characters don't talk, I'm going to just start those, just start. Uh, pulling things together with some kind of uh, at least just a rough animation. And sometimes I'm going to have something that looks pretty, but I'm not going to commit to the final render yet. So this is just basically just going to be a play blast of the animation that's going to be on my timeline at the place where it should go. So that way I get a good idea of the style of animation I want and uh, the kind of flow with the, the scenes. And uh, one of the things I was thinking at first was that all the scenes would be basically at that step during the whole production, and at the very end, I would just render everything. But I realized that the render time that I can afford, sometimes I'm going to have time with, where I have like a whole week worth of computer time I can afford. So sometimes I'm just going to expedite some renders because I know that those scenes are going to be done. Uh, like I, I won't be able, I won't have to change them uh, afterwards because, for example, uh, the character animation is just set. There's no way I'm going to be able to improve it or uh, the, the backgrounds, I know exactly what I'm going to need, so I'm just going to render that right away. Uh, so afterwards, the idea is it just starts com uh, coming together piece by piece. 
And then with the fact that I edit as I'm animating, I have a rough idea of what the full animation will look like uh, as it keeps prog progressing. And the whole idea then is that I can keep, I can work with my musician. In my specific case right now, there's Blue Brony. And we're uh, basically, I show him a work print of what I have with some temp music and the kind of pacing. And then we can talk about the ideas. And the whole idea is that uh, it just starts to come together with all the, uh, the all the music, all the decisions, the final things with the editing. Sometimes I'm going to render a bit more of the scene. For example, if it's just a scene of just derpy gliding, I might add maybe 20 frames, maybe like a couple of seconds more to the animation in my animation program. And the whole idea is it just gives me a more range for the editing later because I realize maybe that I can extend it a bit to make it feel like it flows better. And at the end, there's the editing, there's the final edit, just confirming everything, uh, fixing all the things, doing the could be better. So the whole idea of what the could be better is, is that sometimes you'll notice that some things are slightly off, so you'd like to fix them before release. And the whole uh, idea then after release or before release is to basically do a post postmortem of the whole production. So to see what went wrong, what needs to be improved, because the next project then, I'm going to need to look back at those. For example, one of the problems I realized with uh, the fall of Sunset Shimmer is that I needed to fix the rig. Uh, for example, I couldn't use the normal maps anymore because they were a nightmare to render. So I had to come up with a different solution for, for the character shadows. I had to make a whole system for the muscles because the whole idea is that I just flipped between them with the angle of the head. It became a, a lot of troubles. So I just realized at some point, like, you know, I can just inverse the perspective and change the um, the layering order to have something that just follows the perspective all along. And then I realized that I had to change a bit the workflow for the way that the um, all the layers would be rendered. For example, the outline layer, uh, the way that I was doing it was so inefficient. And those ideas, since I'm doing that near the end of the production of that one, but the beginning of the other one, is that I, get, I have a better understanding of what I'm going to need next uh, as I'm as I'm realizing those mistakes in the previous production. So it really, really, really helps the flow. And the whole idea is that with that, it really uh, helps me. For example, with uh, the beginning of Harmony, I started just modeling a Ponyville for missing out like right as the end of the production was going. And it was a feeling a bit sad because I really want to show how far I've gone, uh, how, how far I've been uh, since the release of that project, even though I just released that project. But it is a kind of uh, process where it keeps evolving and you need to push and push and push to to keep to keep making it and i don't want to tell it as just to tell people like you know the project is done just release it it's gone it's out of your mind and you know just throw it kind of like uh, something that's disposable more as a you know you've done all you could for that project don't need to overthink it just release it people will love it and you know, you can take all the things that you've learned, all the mistakes you've learned from that one, that the audience are either not going to notice or because a lot of things you learn as an animator are things that mostly matter to you as an animator that might, you know, the audience might feel something, but they wouldn't know how to explain it. But the way that you can take that and then improve later, for example, if you realize that your approach for editing was not the best one for that one. You can actually take that as a lesson for the next one and see how you can actually take it, uh, you know, see what kind of path you could go to actually improve it. And I think it's very productive because it really helps you to actually push the kind of animation you want to do instead of uh, just looking back at yourself and feeling bad. So. OK. We're going to do Rem next. All right. I had plenty of time to uh, write up all my thoughts there. So um, <laughs> what I have here is... Uh, so my creative process... I'm going to go bit by bit because there are different you know, aspects to the process. Um, my actual workflow, I'm going to be completely honest, is a freaking mess. I tend to kind of just think about what I want to do, get a few ideas together, you know, write them down somewhere and eventually i just start working on the project once i have a bunch of those loose ideas together and the in between well i kind of just figure out what as i go along so i kind of have like what i would like to say is like a beginning you know i usually have like a beginning of what i want to do and an end of what i want to do 
and then I start in like maybe a couple of ideas in between that I want to make sure actually happens in the project. And then I just start stitching them together. Basically, a part of my creative process is basically the mindset of, ooh, shiny, where I'm like, I just thought of a cool idea I want to put in this. And then I shove it in there somehow. And I start stitching it together and start making it actually work together like that. Um, because I have a very, I'm legitimately, I uh, have a very ADHD work uh, workflow because I uh, have ADHD. So it kind of just kind of very messy. I tend to like, Think of ideas and just throw them in nonstop. That's genuinely what I do with most of my projects. And it kind of works. The thing it works best for is if you want your animations to look cool. Like if you're doing, like I haven't done a fight scene per se, but you know, if you're wanting to do like a fight scene or something like that, or if you're wanting to just, you know, you're doing a more comedic project and you think of ideas along the way you want to throw in, that's what that really works for. It's a little worse for super detailed stories and worlds, but. Eventually, I'm going to work on trying to get storyboards down and stuff like that, though I think I'm always going to have a bit of the uh, workflow I have where I'm very ADHD about what I do, where I jump from one idea to the next idea to the next idea and try to stitch those together with the story to make it work. And the thing is, a big this actually kind of helps me stay motivated is once I make that cool idea and see it happen, like see the character move in that specific way, it always excites me to keep working more because I'm like, wow, I... I just did that, and it looks really good. Cool, let's start making more ideas. And then I start to think of even more ideas. Maybe I thought of them in between the animating time. Like, I'm currently animating something. I'm like, oh, this other idea I want to add will also work. That kind of thing. Um, I do think it is, like, you know, just best to make sure you do have some sort of middle, some sort of beginning and end, because if you don't, you'll have a genuine mess and not an actual cohesive animation. But that's just a part of it. Um, now, another part of my, uh, workflow, um, is basically, I actually, because of how I do things, it's a lot of researching out of nowhere, because, you know, my style is very, like, random a lot of the time, where I'm constantly thinking of different ideas. I have to eventually start looking up how to actually implement those ideas in the middle of the project, um, because, you know, I'm still very new to animation. It's my first year doing it. And so I start actually looking up, like, advice from other people or how they do certain things. Uh, with SFM, you, you have a, a good amount of resources, but it is eventually it is a bit finite because I've learned that a lot of the things I want to do, I have to go directly to an SFM animator to figure it out, which, by the way, if you are wanting to learn SFM specifically, I highly suggest going into the Pony SFM server. It is a great place to ask for help. Um, another part of my workflow. So usually this is how it goes whenever I want to actually like start working on the project. This is like what I do uh, piece by piece. Is first, I start focusing on making the environments. Then I start setting up like the poses of the characters along with the camera angle that I'm wanting to start with. So... I actually end up using like different modes of SFM. The one of the modes I use is I, I think it's the motion editor. Yeah, I use the motion editor to actually set my characters up, which you'll figure that out eventually if you actually do look into SFM. It's one of the most basic things you're going to have to start learning is those type of things. And then when I want to start actually animating, I start using the graph editor um, once I've posed my characters and set up the camera angle. Now, the reason I do this is because you have to click certain parts of the models. Like if you move the entire model in the uh, motion editor. I think I got the right ones in mind. Um, it tends to break it a lot. Um, or not the motion editor. When you're doing it in the graph editor, it tends to break it a lot. Uh, so that's why I set up in the motion editor first, because it just makes that process a little bit easier. And then after that, uh, after I've got all the setup, I start focusing on the camera movements as I go along with the animation. I start animating and making the characters do the things I want them to do, and I make the camera movements move with them and all that stuff. And finally, after I finish up all of the animation, I then enable lighting because, fun fact, I leave lighting turned off. Like, I literally disable lighting completely whenever I'm uh, working on my animation. Just how I do things, I don't know if that's the correct way to do things, but that's what I like to do. And then afterwards... I actually start working on my lighting and my uh, trying to think of everything I actually like to do. So I enable lighting, start working on that. Yeah, so basically that's what I do. I start working on the lighting. I have to set up all the lights and stuff. And 
the, the fun part about that is, is since I've already animated everything, I know how I need to set my lights up to actually follow the characters and stuff like that if I need to make sure it looks good the entire time. So you don't end up with stuff like, oh, uh, this part of the character's face is too dark I because I decided to set up the lighting in a certain way, like as I'm animating. Instead, I'm like, I know exactly where the light needs to go because everything's already animated. So that's why I like doing it that way. And then I set my settings to max and my render an my render settings to max and export. And it takes a very long time to export that image sequence. But almost every single time I suggest trying to do the highest settings you can if your computer can handle it. Because on SFM, if you're not doing max settings, it's probably not going to look that good. Um, and it's a bit dependent on the project. I tend to do sound effects either in the middle of the animation sometimes, or I do it post-processing, depending. I will say sound is probably my weakest area, but, like, you know, if I'm using, like, a meme or something like that, or, like, a, a you know, a shit post or something, I, obviously, I'm going to be animating that inside the animation. Like, I'm going to be using that audio inside the animation. Or if I give I'm Shadow audio to, like, you know, s actually speak, you know, if I give her, like, lines to speak, I need to do that in the middle of the animation. Take but a if shot I every time I'm Shadow is mentioned, sorry. <laughs> well, She's I, mean, I did bring her up earlier. So. Yeah, but so the thing is, though, is ah, oh, damn it, that threw me off a bit. I have a bad memory. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm an fine. interruptive person. But sound effects. So afterwards, I sometimes add sound effects if they work. If that's just how I want the workflow to work at the time, because also Premiere Pro is a lot better for sound effects than SFM. But, uh, yeah. And speaking of post-production, another part of that as well, you know, if the whole doing sound effects and post-production, I start cleaning up the lighting a bit because, again, I'm mentioning the limitations of SFM. But also, honestly, this is the case for a lot of animation anyways, but especially if you're using something like SFM, it is very good to clean up your lighting and stuff like After Effects or Premiere Pro because generally it's not going to look that great until you actually start doing more lighting stuff inside uh you know the actual tools you have like the editing tools you have and i use that for adding extra effects as well that i could not do in sfm and yeah that's generally what my entire creative process is like it's very very messy the main thing that is you know i do have a set order and when i do things but the animation itself is very very uh messy on what i actually want to do at a time I like how everyone else is giving like this play by play of their like workflow and I'm just like, man, I just think of those emotions and they carry me. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I mean, there's a lot of emotions that come to me when I animate. Just anger, you know, frustration. The right one. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when something yeah. crashes. Yeah. Okay, hey, there's good emotions too when something looks really cool and it oh all comes God. together. You're like, yes! That feeling, yes! That feeling of a sequence coming together, yeah, there's nothing like it. You, and you look back and you're like, oh my goodness, I, I made this happen. Yeah, it's like it's, I did that. Well, how did I do that? I'm magic! <laughs> I'm magic, yes. Okay. Well, EG, it's your turn. Okay, so... <laughs> You guys are, uh, uh, I'm the completely polar opposite because I'm like, because uh, I set myself some goals and some, uh, and a list uh, of organizing myself. Because <laughs> no offense to everyone, but, um, oh, I do that too. yeah, uh, just if you're going to be uh, starting out like an animated chore, like which I highly recommend, just start with just two minutes uh, and get a story out or of sorts, uh, outline your story, uh, have it written. Um, more importantly, it's just, um, before you start animating, it's important to just do thumbnails. Like, you don't have to, like, put it and make your thumbnails so, uh, so pretty looking. Just give them, like, basic, basic doodles on them. Just to, uh, get your visual out to see what you can do uh, once you start at, into the production cycle. Um... Yeah, storyboarding is like is the most important thing to start with before uh, animating. Because believe me, I've done animation before without even storyboarding, and that was just end up improving, which slowed down my animation process. Because uh, I had to like redo shots that I did not like, and I had to like reanimate the whole thing all over again. Uh, uh, all those frames I've drawn gone and uh, start over again. This was like my earliest years during my uh, during my college years. And I hate it. Um, but yeah, just storyboarding, anim doing animatics is 
it is the best way to get it to get your idea out. Just have it. It just even if you don't feel like getting it and getting a fully animated and now uh, the animatic is like the bet the best way you can feel satisfied to just um to just uh again it, it have it, it visualized visualized pose by pose piece by piece it it, it it's gonna it, it gets me more organized when i uh get the anime uh, the animatic done and if i'm happy with it i move on to the next uh, to the next level which is animating the whole thing um yeah yeah, uh, just um, character animation. I I separate that from doing anything else. Backgrounds, um, and backgrounds like um, uh, uh, visual effects. I can always get someone to do that for me. I do have I do hire uh, a background artist to do the backgrounds for me, and I just focus on the character animation. And, and hey, if you ever need fireworks, you know where to go. Uh, who go? Yeah, the fireworks yeah. factory. Yeah, yes, the you actually did. Man. You actually did remind me a lot of the time. I do like I do separate my like my actual like character animation and like stuff that happens in the background. Usually, oh, yeah. I do the character animation first, and then the background details after. Yeah, dur- when I was doing the Sparky the Hummingbird animation, I did the I did that uh, all by myself. Everything, everything was there. the uh, The effects, the the backgrounds, characters, everything, and it burned the hell out of me. <laughs> Never again. It's so, hard. so for now on, I just organize myself and just doing the characters. That that is all I care about uh, because they, they're the ones who drive uh, the the animation moving forward. Um, and, and it's all about just uh, again. Um, uh, be sure to uh, what I also love. Uh, what I also do, even before animating, I just draw a couple of poses. To see which ones I'm, uh, I like to use and test around, uh, to see, uh, just to um, uh, play with the animation uh, uh, later on. When I did the alicorn, um, when I did the alicorn cop out, um, that that final animation was not the final version. There was an original shot I did where Twilight was, um, it were, um, it, it, when she was when she was flaying around and being mad. As if you, as if you see in that GIF in the in the podcast <laughs> thumbnail, um, I had a different camera pose, and this was all done in 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 the storyboard process. Um, I was breaking the one eighty rule, which I which that's important not to break and not to break when you're animating uh, with two characters. Unless um, you're intentionally doing it, of course. Yeah, it, it, it's optional too. Um, so I I switched that and and gave a, a completely different pose, which was much easier and more visually appealing. It it, it when it, when um, when I change yeah when I finished the um, the animatic process, um, you can I can always uh change uh, camera positions and poses, uh just do at least two or three different shots from the same from the same scene. To see which one works, and then I and then and then I just I just cherry pick and see which one works for me, and then I move on to the next. So I just take things one step at a time uh, from each shot, and um, and then move forward. Like eh, eh. like uh, when I did my storyboard, uh, when I did you know, story when I studied in storyboard classes uh, uh three months ago, it really helped me change so much of my uh my storyboard process. I actually wanted to mention because I didn't even bring this up. I have like a sorry. I know I'm just interrupting, but I wanted to. Oh, you're good. I, I, I actually finished anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. I have like a weird storyboard process with what I do because um, obviously, like I make PMVs and some stuff is like physically boarded where I'm actually like drawing things out and then I you know make it happen in whatever program I'm using. But I what I do for timing is I make like a written storyboard that's actually just words. And like, I have like, here's what I want in this scene and what I want in this scene. Da, 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 da. And I think that's such an important part of the boarding process that I don't think um, a lot of like newer people realize is that uh, storyboarding is not just getting your posing down and all of that. It's getting the pacing and the timing and like the flow of everything down too. And that's mm-hmm. such a, that's such an important part of of whatever you're working on, whether it's a PMV, a, a movie, whatever, you gotta 
you got to get the timing. So, you know, okay, so this scene is going to take this long and this scene is going to take this long and it's going to flow into this. And, and then you can actually watch that back and say, oh, maybe that's happening a little too long. I can shorten that because it's a big thing. You want to make sure your thing is properly paced. So like, don't just think of storyboarding as, oh, I want to make sure all my characters are posed in the right positions. It's got to be timing. Timing is everything. Timing, yes. Timing's your best friend. Yep. Okay. Considering you make PMVs, yeah, I think timing is extremely important for you too. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the big thing that working on the PMVs has taught me, and it's I think it's part of what's made my like process of getting into character animation i guess not the it, it's gone smoother than i thought it would is because i've already had so much experience with timing and timing and more timing and i think vincent's so, the last one so it's his turn man it's been so long <laughs> actually it's been so long do you mind restating the question please what does your creative process look like for animation, okie dokie. Well, first it starts off with an idea, like a story I want to tell, the characters and all that stuff, and then comes the script writing process where I go over it, see, um, you know, what's within my budget, how long do I want it to be, and that sort of thing. And once I have that sorted out, um, it's time to send it off to the voice actors. And sometimes while I wait for their availability, I'll go in and I'll start uh, designing the 30 sets on paper, which typically for me are very simple top-downs to kind of envision what the set's going to look like. I'll start gathering reference, and then, you know, once I actually have the lines, is typically when you can begin the animation process. Or sometimes I will go ahead and I'll start building the 3D sets, which is the longest time of production aside from animation and whether animation or the full 3d set building comes first really just depends um i know it's typically recommended that you start with block ins and then you do the animation although sometimes i've done the reverse only because a i like to see all of what's in the frame because it helps me actually place my characters in the scene properly Especially if I'm doing what I do, which is uh, in Blender, which is the natural lighting approach, where I don't want to do any fake, like, rim lights or point lights, which can look really pretty. But I, I personally prefer the uh, Christopher Nolan-style approach, where all the, the uh, lighting in the set on the characters is natural, which typically means you have to really think about where your light sources and your character placement are relative to the camera. Um, but... It really just depends on the scene and depends on what I really feel like doing first. Um, animation typically starts with like basic, basic movements, which then I can refine further. Uh, and once that's done, I, I then have to go in and uh, lip sync the characters, which is my least favorite part of animation to do. Uh, and once all the final animation looks good, I can bake all the animation physics, which I have to save a separate file on, because every time uh, I bake the physics pass in Blender's workflow, it bakes down every single frame of the animation, which you can't really edit afterwards. Um, but, you know, once that's done, then I can, you know, actually sit down and render, and the final stages can begin, which... First time around, I did not realize how long it would take to <laughs> fix all my render settings. I think for the first two minutes of animation, it took me about a week and, like, multiple overnights because, you know, oh no, like, this highlight's uh, not working correctly or this or that, or I wanted to change something in the shot or I spotted an error. Um, and then I'd, I would actually have to tweak the sets. Like, I found out that uh, some surfaces can't be reflective because there's limitations there, and I don't want to do too many workarounds because that would just increase budget time. And, of course, I talk with many different friends who are versed in that for advice. But, yeah, but typically that's just a general rundown. It's once I come up with the story, then comes the voice recording and comes the set design. 
And then from there, I can start plopping characters into 3D scenes. And occasionally, I will get a storyboard person. I did for the first scene of my animation, just because uh, animating sirens are very new to me. Uh, they're not creatures I have really rendered before, and part of that's trying to figure out, like, well, how do they look when they move or animate or express like human? It's very new to me. So in that case, I kind of needed the help of a storyboard artist to guide the movements. And from there, I was able to figure out a lot of improv along the way, which makes all her animations just uh, feel natural. And so, you know, and during the production, you might find, oh, you know, this line doesn't make sense, or maybe I need another wide shot to emphasize that this character is feeling lonely, or maybe we need to pull in the camera closer. So you'll figure this, that's why pre-visualization is so important. And for those that don't know what uh, pre-visualization is, it basically is you have a rough, very rough um, block-in of your set. It could literally be represented by cubes and planes. But as long as they are to scale of your environment, um, that's the point. You want to plop your character in the scene, see how they roughly look as far as all the composition goes, and you can start moving the camera around. And the idea is that it's a very rough, it's like a, a, a 3D moving uh, storyboard, where essentially, and it doesn't matter if your character is T-posing, like, the character can just scoot around. It's The idea is to test the pacing of your scene, and how mainly shots will be thrown out, because... That's important because your cam what your camera captures will heavily influence how an animation should look. Because, you know, as Ram was saying earlier in the scene, it doesn't matter if the character stands like a million miles away. If the camera is at a certain angle, you're never going to notice it. And in some ways, you can actually... It's preferable to cheat. Um, without spoiling too much, I know I did one scene where uh, Sonata is supposed to be looking at an object off-screen. And typically, if you were to look at the perspective of the object that she's looking at, her head should be, should be more pointed away from the camera. But with that panning shot, her head didn't look right. So I would have to... So I kind of cheated and tilted her head closer to the camera so you could see more of her eyes, because that composition looked better. So, you know, there's multiple steps to the production, and for me, it typically, it takes longer with this one, because... This is the first full-on project I've done in Blender to this extent, and a lot of custom work has gone into custom 3D sets and all that stuff, and I do most of this on my own. Uh, so, once I have the roots down for writing and stuff, then it begins all the rest, but that's roughly my technical process, basically. Okay. So, before we end it for today, we've got a few questions that uh, were asked by the audience. This one is specifically for Vincent. Um, do you plan to do any more of the 6 to 8 minute 3D animations? It's from Wushi. I'm assuming you mean more of my uh, comedic ones, like you know, Applejack or Ponies Unraveled. I don't know if that's exactly what you mean. Um... If that's if if that if that's what you mean, I know I don't really plan on doing something like that anytime soon, only because I have um two projects that are currently all the focus of my time, which is the one starring Sonata. And then there's the Fading Light, which is basically put on a back burner until this Sonata project is done. And this Sonata project is already going to be like very massive. And so and that's kind of the story I want to focus on before diving into more, um, I should, how do I put this? Diving into more, uh, unique territory, I should say. So, unless I have a really good idea, probably not, but even then, I have to, like I said, when I, earlier I said to find your balance, I can't really, I can't really focus on too many things at once, because... You know, you should already balance out your time, and making it, doing an animation on and off takes months of work. Any work I do aside from that just pushes my goal further away, and the last thing you want to do is stretch yourself too thin. So, while these projects are being focused on, uh, no, I don't have any of those types of animations planned out. But I will say that this animation will probably be longer than six to eight minutes. 
it'll definitely be longer, but obviously not comedy centered. This one's a very uh, serious story. Okay. This question is for everybody. It's from Adir. Um, what's your go to subject to draw or animate when you feel a bit of creative block? Ooh, good question. If I name- that was a good question. Yeah. EG sounded uh, like he wanted to say something. Yeah, I would say like you know, like um when when I do storyboarding for my animation, like uh, while the process is easy, getting a vision is for me it's very hard to come up with because it takes me time to just stare at my at my drawing board or or in this case in my my drawing software and which I use Clip Studio or Photoshop or or Tim Boom, I just look at it blindly and just uh staring at it like okay what kind of vision should i give it and that's not really the right way for me to handle it so what i do i just uh, take the time to just go out for walks and just or meditate and to uh, to uh think of what kind of vision should i give for my stories like if, if, when you start scripting your uh, your story it's e- it gives you something to visualize and you will take the time to visualize it in your head and that's going to give you the epiphany to um and, and to draw something. So I was able to um uh, go outside more, uh, socialize with people. Uh, like heck, uh, heck, like any any moment out there, if uh, you do physically, uh, or or watch any movies that you grew up with that you liked that has inspired you before, you can always go back to them again and see details of what you can do and maybe alter. And maybe um, what I do is uh, I alternate those uh, those shots to uh, mix it mix it in my own, uh, which is one of those one of those things called "Steal Like an Artist." So, uh, which is uh, something motivating for me to uh, uh, to uh, get, and then I um, and then I just start drawing. What I also do is um, is uh, find uh, find any pose it any drawing posing like i always go outside in the draw like i mentioned before i draw animals i draw a eh, eh, people um and then i start changing those poses in, in eh, of my own eh, eh, change, eh, change the character's expression to look like this look like that um it gives gives some variety and something unique because eh, eh, like anything you see visually gives you a blueprint and and that's when I start um, a few more engaged with my with my uh, drawing process. With, and when it comes to like either storyboarding or just live drawing, and I get to uh, the animation segment. Yeah, it's all about it's all about just uh, taking a step back and just uh, visualize and, and visualize uh, within you. <laughs> as as weird as that sounds, I. I actually wanted to say something for this, and it's literally like sure. a very different style from EG <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, I like to start working in on still. So here's the basic thing I use for inspiration. If I'm like, dang, I really don't know what I want to animate, or I don't have the motivation to animate for whatever reason, I'm like, you know what, screw it. I have a different medium to work with. So for one, obviously, I could just work on a different type of video. I, I do that sometimes. But if I don't want to do that, one thing that does help me a bit is I try to make still images in SFM. So I still utilize those because sometimes, you know, it's good for practice. For one, I use those to practice lighting hardcore. Compared, that's the, that is the main time I'm going to want to practice lighting so that I can start utilizing that in actual videos is when I'm making a still image because it's better. It's a lot easier to make that the main focus. And so I start making an image of, let's just say, you know, Prince whatever's Code Phantom. I uh, use that to make it like a still image of that because I, I basically I like to make still images of things I can't usually animate um, or animate yet at the very least. And so like, you know, like I said, Code Phantoms, like a little thing of Sweetie Bot, Sweetie Bell falling uh, with the skyscrapers. I made a little like image of that or I made like a cyborg Scootaloo uh, again based off of Prince's uh, something Prince made with his latest album Redefine in a uh, being caught by a bunch of cops in a cyberpunk setting or if i'm going less on the serious side of things and i just want an idea of what i want to make for a video i will start looking through different memes or comic dubs (laughs) um 
because sometimes what if I just want to animate one of those? Because, you know, I'm I, a lot of memes and stuff I, or comics I don't want to animate, but a lot of them I might want to. And so I just look at some that, you know, resonate with me a lot. And I'm literally subscribed to Cheebs, who is a uh, voice actor in the fandom, who both me and Maka have uh, utilized her uh, dubs before. Usually she's doing a uh, dub of a... Gosh, why? I am blanking out on the Punkit. She's usually doing a dub of a uh, Punkit uh, comic that me and Maka have utilized a few times. Uh, because it... Honestly, is a really great place for an and for like a source of ideas. If you're wanting to like actually think of just specifically a shit post of what to make, and you're running out of ideas, you got pe- you got people that made ideas for you. Now you just got to do the hard work of actually animating it. So that is uh that is kind of like a nice little area I use sometimes if I really just cannot think of my own like original idea at a time. Okay. Uh, I uh. Huh? Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, like, I mentioned it a little before, but a lot of the inspiration stuff is just from, you know, living life and seeing what happens. But for, like, something that I would, like, be creating specifically if I have some kind of block is uh, is really just going into, um, like, because the program that I use for particles is a uh, trap code particular with a, which is like a plugin for After Effects. And I will just go into that and just kind of see, like, what can I do? How far can I push this? And it's just good practice. And maybe it'll end up turning into something that I actually end up using in a video, or it just ends up being uh, that just that just a little practice. And maybe I'll just make something weird. Um, but like also just like making a shit post is so uh, relaxing. Not no, 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 relaxing. That's not the right word. It's very, um, it's fun because it's very, non-substantial in terms of what the quality needs to be it can really just be anything um like when you just make a goofy video just when you know you need that that break uh and there's really no stakes to it like it's not like you're gonna put you're gonna throw it on like a second channel or something uh so it's not like you're gonna upload this and everyone's gonna be like what is this i'm unsubscribing um but so that that's definitely very like freeing to just when you get locked into these projects where everything has to be perfect, uh, and then you can just make something and really silly that's, you know, maybe took you like an hour to make, and that's a lot of fun. But yeah, again, just living the life and live life, be goofy. There you go. Okay. Allie, you want to go next? Uh, I'd say if I have a creative block, I just don't touch my <laughs> my tablet or anything um uh because i remember when i try I, I try to draw and i have a an art block i just i feel mad i can't i can't do anything i can't uh for example if it's a commission i, I can't do it i just stop it before getting even angrier <laughs> and um i either play some games or something or hang out with friends or like i heard a do a different media for example um either try drawing traditionally or um lately i've been crocheting too so like crocheting doing something instead of drawing and that's basically just do something else that's either from drawing uh digitally and um but when i i noticed that it comes back once i I just take take the ta- the the time off from drawing and also like watching other other artists draw or like animate or um do their work um watching for example social media you can see any other drawings or animations uh the that other artists do so that takes the inspiration back from me okay Minty. So I got two things that really helped me when I'm basically just feeling a creative block. There is always the idea. Uh, sometimes I'm just going to try to go in a software I already know, and I try to experiment, to try to see if I can pull something off that I've never pulled before. Uh, one of the things I was trying to do recently was basically just trying to find a way to do 
weird voids that would basically be, just be kind of like portals to different worlds uh, using the hold node, uh, li- well, the holdout node in Blender. And the whole idea was, this, was thinking like, can I try to blend it with transparency and stack it in cards with uh, uh, some kind of noise pattern to try to make it some kind of like weird cloud. And instead of being just the texture of a cloud, it's basically just uh, basically just uh, some kind of mask and you put a picture behind and you use a render from a different world that matches the camera. So at some point I was just experimenting, just trying to do that because I was just not feeling too creative. Sometimes just figuring out like, can I try to work on my rig because I got a rig that I've been trying to work on um, on the side, basically just an improvement of the kind of rig that I was doing where it's basically fixing all the problems I've had before. But it's mostly just seen as a side project. And uh, when it comes to draw sometimes, I just you know take a, uh, something I've already made and I kind of just try to draw over to see. And that's kind of how I got my new uh, the new main for my Minty. I basically just got bored and I thought like, let's see what my OC would look like with curly hair. And sometimes uh, when it comes to drawing, sometimes I just try to just draw any sort of kind of fan art I want to do. I don't really post it because I feel very self-conscious about the, the resulting art because it's more of a thing I just draw on the side. But, you know, it's, it's a good idea for me to just practice and give some use for the tablet I got. So I think it helps out. Uh, sometimes it's just very weird ideas that might not help for other projects. Like I drew three OCs for a, a side project I wanted to do and the side project is not happening yet. But I felt like it was just a productive use of my time, and I got some ideas going. Okay, and Vincent. Mm, creator's block. Always fun. Um, if it's for writing, I typically will either listen to music. Music is a big inspiration. Sometimes I'll watch media that I really enjoy. Um, if it's for 3D set design, it's either going through a bunch of references or watching my favorite movies. I know one case, like, one frame from a particular movie gave me, idea, gave me an idea for decorating the entire set, so something small like that will typically help. Or, I could just, you know, not do it all together. Like, anything else, whether it be taking a meal break, uh, actually sleeping for that night, hanging out with friends, just... Doing something that either recharges or just rests your mind. Sometimes you have to step away from a bit uh, before, because you don't want to push your brain over to the ground if you're not, if you can't find any results. Uh, those are some of the methods that I do. Or sometimes, if I don't feel like doing a particular scene or a particular part of an animation, I'll just uh, go work on another scene. No one says that you have to work on animation in a, any particular order. So. Those are a few strategies that I like to implement myself. Okay. And next question is from Kenneth Apthorpe. Uh, I'm a. This one was phrased a little weird. I'm a. When you have two characters talking to each other in a co- extended conversation, how do you make that not boring? I uh I actually have a lot of how I do this because I make comedic stuff, but uh. The way I make that not boring, personally. I, th- this is actually going to be a really quick one, I feel. Uh, so, the way I make that stuff not boring, personally, is by making characters just move very, like, a lot. Yeah, basically, like, every single thing that I ca- Every time a character's, like, speaking, you make them move around a lot. And you kind of have, like, a lot of fluidity and a lot of motion. You do that specifically because it makes characters not look very boring. Hell, not even in comedy stuff, because even in serious stuff, you always want, like motion now of course that motion you want it to actually have purpose you don't want it to be completely random and for no reason but now i'm not saying this is a bad show overall it's not my cup of tea but i will say something like for example family guy is a very good example of the actual animation not looking very it being very boring to look at because when the characters are speaking they will move their lips sometimes very occasionally move a hand and if they're not speak if they're not the ones speaking they aren't moving at all to me that is a very very bad way to do animation it is very boring to watch so generally you want your characters to constantly be doing some sort of movement my little pony is a great example of this because you'll always see characters do things like you'll see their eyes like 
twitch a little. They might look at a little detail somewhere else, then look back at the character who's talking. They might, you know, move their hooves a bit, or they might, like, <clears throat> in the case, like, I don't know, like, Twilight is a great example of someone who does this a lot. She might move her wings around a little bit while she's listening, or, like, you know, they always move their heads a bit, you know, nod their head down, look back up, you know, move, and, like, you know, just constant movement. And the speaker especially the speakers are always like moving and, you know, moving their hooves and like trying to move their head around. That's how you make conversations not boring because when you're actually having a conversation, like hell, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not on camera, but I'm moving my hands around a crap ton right now. <laughs> like just right now, even though you can't see it. And it's because that is just how you naturally speak. And it helps keep people engaged when you do stuff like that. Yeah, and so, language. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I would actually like to take that step further and say that um, even stiller conversations um, have the potential to not be boring. Mm -hmm. And I would also argue that that depends on the audience that you're shooting for. Like, if you look at shows like Star Trek, a lot of the time, it's just them sitting on their consoles, mm -hmm. like, talking mm -hmm. at each other. I mean, yeah, they might occasionally move or press a button, but what makes those scenes interesting are typically the subject matter. Like, either some sort of threat that they're facing, or you might have some serious scenes where they're, where they're talking about something very important or very uh, thought-provoking. And sometimes it's just your subject matter should be the, the thing to bring your audience in. Um, I know anime typically has minimalistic movements sometimes during conversations, but you know, anime can spice that up quite a bit by either what's in the background, what the subject matter is, how pretty the character looks like. There's a million different ways to do that. And, you know, a couple of, few of these people already brought things up, like, body language is important. Because um, you, you can show people a lot by not doing much. Like, eyebrows or eyes. Or maybe, and like I said, maybe sometimes the writing can carry it. I think one of the best examples of that is the move, is the scene from Jaws, where the captain talks about where his boat sank and his crew got attacked by sharks. He is just sitting there at the table talking. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure he does some body language around that. The camera really just focuses on him and really doesn't do much else. But the soundtrack and his acting sell it 100 percent like it is a very chilling scene and they have no need for like these big you know say how people say show don't tell and typically that's the example you should follow but in that case and that scene in jaws it worked I because say, i oh sorry sold the scene but will, uh a couple I, of a couple more comments um just real quick um but yeah, and like I said, you're like I'm an environment artist. Sometimes what's going on in the background can make it more interesting. Like making your environment feel alive with smaller little things can help. Like if you have very nice lighting and make the shot look pretty, that can carry the shot as well. But there, like, but yeah, those are the last two points I was gonna say. I wanted. Oh, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say something real fast. I don't disagree, by the way. Like, I, I when I say constant oh, yeah. motion, you know, that does include, like, you mentioned the eyebrow movements. That's kind of what I'm meaning as well. It's like, I'm not saying you have to have the character constantly moving their body. Oh, yeah. Actually, what I was... Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, someone was going to say something? I was going to say something. Like, if I can add, like, uh, if you want to go more obscure with your animations uh, and just but also make it unique as possible, you can, you can also do that. You can, like, just break the fucking rules with, <laughs> and yeah, with your and animation. Like, yeah. one anime did, one anime, for example, that did that a lot and had fun with it was Fully Cooly. The first season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can yeah. see from the clips I showed. Yeah, what I would also say is I don't I don't watch Family Guy myself. I've seen enough of the clips on the internet. It's like, they are, their animation is very stiff. But what keeps people interested is generally the source material. That's fair. It makes it's up for it. I'm not, uh, not to discredit your point, Ram. I'm just saying like that. That's one way you can make it interesting. Your points are also a way to make it interesting. So what's, what I'm trying to say is, is that there are more ways than motion that you can make it interesting. Motion works. Okay. Other things work too. So in that case, we, you know, we both brought up some good tips, basically. I want to say something. Uh, well, like, I'm I saying who, who's saying? Uh, I heard you try to speak up, Cole. I think. Uh, was someone else talking? 
I was going to say something let, too, but uh, if we're going to awesome let's let, all talk over. Hold on. We're going to let EG That's how speak, dialogue. And then uh, after EG, Minty can go. Yeah. I was going to say, oh. like, um, yeah, um, uh, even if, uh, like, uh, I want to clarify also when breaking the rules of animation, like, uh, you got to make it, you got to make it work and make it and have it make sense. Because, um, because if you're just gonna uh, break animation rules for the sake of it, then it, it's just gonna uh, uh, confuse your audience. You have to uh, uh, make the timing and, and make some of those uh, segments work. It may be difficult, but one anime I highly recommend watching is is the first season of Fully Cooly. They know how to just fuck around with the animation perfectly, and They're and crazy. every single shot in that in in that anime works. A lot of movement, a lot of a lot of eye catching moments. It, it just it just says screw the rules. I, we're giving you a we're giving you a a, a fun anime. <laughs> Aren't they the same studio that made Evangelion? Uh, yes, Gynax made it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's also worth noting whenever you have that kind of conversation scene where you have two characters uh, that are just talking back and forth. A lot of it, uh, lots of people, what they think when it comes to dialogue is that uh, they just think of the things that people say, but not the things that they don't say. I, I compare it to jazz, where the whole idea with jazz is it's not just about the notes they play, it's also the notes they don't play. So sometimes you might have a scene where you have two characters talking, and sometimes just having one character just being completely silent and not actually saying the thing might actually say more than the other way around. I had a scene where you had Celestia talking with Luna, and uh, the whole scene uh, is for the opening for the false sense of tremor. The whole idea, the scene was um, Celestia simply talking with Luna, saying, like, do you think I have a chance at uh, redemption? Can I be redeemed? And the the, the whole way was basically just being uh, kind of vague, because you think the way that she was talking was that she was talking about redeeming Sunset, but she meant more like redeeming herself. And eventually I just realized all of it is going to be implied with the scene after in a way that is framed, the fact she feels bad at staring at a sunset. And I just realized I'm going to cut all that dialogue that I already wrote. I'm just going to have her just say, I know. And just she just says that while turning to Luna. She doesn't even like introduces herself to Luna. And she doesn't mention that she knows because it's in a relationship with Luna. And I thought it said so much more. And there was a scene where you had, um, you had Celestia in a hallway of forbidden objects. And you don't really know why she's there. And, uh, and I had originally was planning to have a whole thing where, where uh, Celestia was saying, like, this is a very, very secret alley. Like, you can't be there. And then I just realized, oh, She's feeling very uncomfortable in the way that she was talking, the way that it's framed, because it's very, very dimly lit. But since it just pops out because she's completely clashing, and you really feel like there is some kind of invasion of space, and she feels very um, confrontational when she, uh, when Sunset just puts her hoof in a mirror. And I thought like a lot of it just says a lot without di- a lot of dialogue, and it's not very complex. It's just three shots. So it's basically her reacting in shock when she sees sunset sunset just walking from one to the other, one side to the other and then sunset putting her hoof and then uh, the hoof being pulled with magic and the hoof being pulled with magic is the easiest thing to do because the magic is sli- just a slight glow that's around an object and it just pulls a bit the hoof nothing else and those elements just says so much more just by the fact that they're there in a clever way instead of trying to overthink it with like 20 pages worth of dialogue just to explain the situation that could be explained with just a couple of words and one very, very telling image. And it's one of the things I really recommend whenever people look at a script before animating it, like look at all the things that the characters say and look at all the things you could infer just by the way that they're saying it. And basically play play Tetris with the story elements to make it feel like you're learning a lot from not a lot. It's a um, very densely packed storytelling, and uh, one of the best examples of densely packed storytelling you can give is Back to the Future. Like the script is tight, you learn so much about what's going on in so many few scenes, and they don't say a lot. 
surprisingly. So it's one of the, the examples I could give. Like, really think, think of the way that you present the things because the flow of information, the way that you introduce the information is so much more effective. And it's also uh, because uh, lots of movies that just dump exposition after exposition after exposition to try to explain things, it just feels overwhelming and the audience just drops out. So if you go with something else, it just works so much better. Okay. Cole, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah. Um, well, I'm just... Cause again, this, I feel like it's coming more from like a writing standpoint than an animating standpoint at this point because uh, I just said the word point a lot. Um, we, like, when you're animating dialogue, again, I'm coming more of an outsider at this point and more of an observer because I haven't really done much of this yet. But uh, I think your dialogue is definitely the number one thing or not even the dialogue just the writing of the scene because if there's like a stage directions and stuff so that's what i mean by like the writing is the number one thing when it comes to a, a conversation um and having the characters or it's like keeping track of what emotional state the characters are in and what knowledge that they all have essentially is a really important thing um because it's like, if someone needs to be surprised by something because they don't know it, then you got to make sure that's then that's known to both the audience. That, okay, they didn't know that information or whatever. Okay, they this character does know this information. And of course, there's that relation to the audience of what does the audience know? And what does the audience know that the characters know? And like, if you're you going to have this conversation set up in a way where like, oh, uh, the audience knows that one character is lying to the other. And so now you're watching the other character that's being lied to uh, have incorrect information. And is that on purpose? Is it meant to frustrate you? What is like, and it goes back to what I was talking about before about like intentions behind what you're doing. So I feel like with conversational stuff, you really need to think about those intentions and, and not just your intentions as the artist, but your character's intentions and wh where are they coming from? Where are you coming from? And yeah, again, it all comes back down to uh, to what I was saying before about the intentions of what you're doing, I think, because I think boring dialogue comes from a few things, and that's the idea of um, I, as the audience, I knew this already. Why are we going over this again? Um this is something that I don't feel like the character would be doing at this time. So why are they saying it? This doesn't make any sense. I'm clocking out and things like this is just, <laughs> again, it, it's really easy to say it's badly written, but you know, like, yeah, things that are badly written in the sense of like, Oh, this is interesting, but the wording choice is poor kind of thing and that's what we really mean by I think badly written not just talk huh, cringe um so like yeah just keep keep all of the intentions behind the scene uh in your mind whenever you're whatever you're doing because you could get uh dialogue scenes can often be between more than just two characters they could have 10 characters in the scene that are talking to each other, which means you have a lot to keep track of. So you have more intentions to keep track of. What does everybody in your scene want? Why is everybody in your scene there? Uh, yeah, like essentially, like, just dialogue is a lot to keep track of. So just be careful. Okay. Allie, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> How do, you, how do you keep dialogue between two characters interesting for the audience? Oh, no, not really, because everything has been said. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I did have something I wanted to add before uh, the, the accidental talking over each other happened. Um, it was just the fact that I will say another aspect that I think is pretty big, and again, I'm pulling from My Little Pony specifically for this, is... Things happening in the background a lot. Like, Vin Vincent already touched on this a little bit, too, with talking about the environments and stuff. But not only that, if your two characters having a conversation don't have any actions they can really do, well, then sometimes it helps to have characters in the background do things. Or even, not even they're not doing anything crazy. Like, what if 
I don't know, you have Lyra and Bonbon bon sitting at a bench talking to each other. It's still not that much happening, but it's the fact that the audience has something to look at and while they're uh, watching the conversation too. When there's multiple different things they can actually look at, now obviously you don't want to be too cluttered, but when there's multiple different things to look at, it does help keep the audience engaged into what's actually happening as well. Uh, My Little Pony, the, specifically the later seasons, the early seasons have this a bit less, but as the show goes on, they really always have, they like to always have different things happening in the background. And that on its own is a really useful tool because now you're seeing a lot of different storylines opening up in the background. It's like, oh, those two characters, I've seen them together before. Now I'm seeing them at this, like they're on the train together at one point. Now they're at a restaurant eating together now. They might actually, you know, have, they might have a friendship. They might have a romance or something like that. They have their own little storyline going on in the background. And that helps keep people engaged when their conversations are going on as well. I think it's a thing about like making it makes the world feel alive when you're doing stuff like mm-hmm. that. Because mm-hmm. uh, if it's is if it's just like oh it's a normal day in Ponyville, there would be people out and about doing stuff. So you yep. got to remember that. So if like, I, and I understand it's a limitation of people. So I'm not gonna like hark on like fan animators too much work because it's just more work. But like when you're animating, uh, let's say it's a scene between I don't know Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy. Sure, why not? And they're out about Ponyville. It would. I think a more immersive thing to just have some things happening in the background of their characters because they're out and about. Ponyville would not just be empty with nobody but those two characters in it. And again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like yell at animators for not doing that because that is just a lot more work to do backgrounds and, and uh, crowd work. But if you can do it, it does add to the scene, uh, I believe. Okay. Did you have something else, EG? I was gonna say like um uh, yeah like a uh, not just um yeah like a uh, in, in multiple uh, different animation styles you can you can just screw around with the backgrounds like what kind of what kind of movements you want to make well, you you can either make them natural no, uh real or or stylistic or just obscure random and, and, and or random like um yeah you uh, you have either like a style like of course MLP with the with the background animations. Um, and most new anime tend to do that and nowadays they they do mm-hmm. add more detail with uh with with background animations with uh character back and characters in the background uh you see that in in some anime films too like uh the the ghibli films the studio ghibli films are great examples um and and if you want to go for a more obscure level uh highly recommend smiling friends they do some random stuff happening in the background <laughs> and you see uh, it smiling in friends the smiling friends it's so goofy you just see it in just a tiny, se- a tiny frame of a second. You just see some random shit happening in the background, <laughs> and in half a second, and it just gets stuck in your head. <laughs> it, again, it adds to the experience, and I think it adds to the immersiveness of what you're watching because you feel more exactly. like locked in because you're because now you're looking for stuff. It pulls you into the world of the uh, of your uh, of your project, and, and that's going to help the audience feel more engaged with it too. It's also this is a uh, no. You can go. Yeah. It's also worth noting you don't need to fill the frame with everything all the time. The whole idea is that whenever you do animation or whenever you do filmmaking, the whole idea is that you direct the eyes to go from one thing to the other. So, for mm-hmm. example, you might have a conversation scene where you have two characters talking, and you might have some characters walking by between them, and it gives you something to look at while you're flipping back and forth between the two characters. Uh, so in the whole uh, idea, for example, there was a scene where you had uh, in Magic Duel, the one scene where you had Lyra just drinking a soda in front of everybody. The way <laughs> she plays just fits with the previous and next shot because you look at her and then you look at Pinky in the corner. And just the way that you look back and forth helps so much. It's also really good because it, it tells you a good idea of where to put the most details. And sometimes you might just put some busy work just to make it feel like the frame is completely full. For example, so for example, you might add some like a couple of towers in the back just to make sure that the frame feels full, but those towers might look, you know, a bit more wonky. Sometimes some of the things might be slightly off, but people won't care too much because that's not the main element that they're looking at. But it still, will still feel like a complete picture because there's something there that actually makes the whole thing feel complete. And sometimes uh, one of the examples I give a lot 
is the way that you fill the frame. Uh, for example, there was, there, there was that one scene where you had sunset just next to a tree. The whole idea is that I wanted the tree to be shaped in a way where it covered the top of the frame because it felt a different way than if I actually had the whole uh, the whole sky being exposed. It actually felt like there was something that was covering her and there was that kind of safe area that really helped change the mood. And a lot of it just came down to the idea of the way that the foreground and the background are split. So just thinking of it in a smart way really helps to know exactly what kind of crowd you're going to have because, you know, crowd is going to take a while to plan. So you might have, you might realize like, you know, I'm just going to have two or three ponies there and the way that they're framed, it makes it feel like there's so much more that are outside of the frame. And that helps a lot. Yeah, again, it's, um, I think a little, like in your scenes, a little kinetic energy goes a long way. And I think that's kind of where, like, this is where I come in with, like, the particle stuff. Like, if that's something you can do, like, if you're making a scene and you can just uh, add, like, a little bit of, like, dust particles, like, into it. Because it just it makes it feel more alive. There's more movement. Um, and I know it's just, like, <laughs> just do that because you have to know how to do that. But, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, is a, if that feels like a worthwhile thing for you to figure out because, you know, oh, I want my scenes to feel more kinetic. Uh that's important, you know. I think um, not all movement, uh, like I was saying, with the with the dialogue stuff, has to be this like frantic, insane movement. Sometimes it's just little things moving throughout the scene, just to just to remind like the viewer that like this isn't a live thing. A big thing that I always um, implemented was like when I worked on PMVs, was just to keep things moving. I would just like uh, zoom in on footage ever so slightly when it's just still. Just to keep things moving, because I feel like uh, when you want to have something come to a standstill on purpose, that could be very intentional, and that could uh, give an emotional effect that you're intending. But I feel like most of the time you want to keep things with having some level of movement. And uh, sometimes, like I said, it doesn't even come from the characters. It comes from what else is happening in the environment. Uh so I think, okay, maybe you want to have this dialogue scene be more interesting. Maybe there's a maybe there's a fire next to them or something. I mean, that's that's kind of stereotypical at this point. Of, We're going to have our little conversation by the campfire. But it does add kinetic energy. Or maybe they're, you know, maybe they're by the ocean. So you always have waves going on or something like that. Or maybe, you know, there's just birds flying in the background. Or just little things, again, making your environment feel alive, I think, really adds to dialogue, too. And having the the environment itself also fit the dialogue like oh because then it comes into the conversation of does it make sense for them to be having this conversation here uh so that's another thing that it brings it to but it could also add to it when it does uh make sense for conversations to be uh taking place in certain environments and again it, it also it just makes the whole i think dialogue scenes come together when you have all the elements not just the writing not just the character animation, not just the environment, but all of it. It needs to all come together and become one, uh, become one whole body of a thing, essentially. Okay. Well, I think that for now, that's going to be all for the night. Um, we're about almost three hours in, actually. So we're going to go ahead and... Uh, in the podcast for the night. For those of you that may or may not still be watching, if you enjoyed that and would like to see more of it, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, follow on Twitch, all of that good stuff to stay up to date with all of the uh, podcasts and streams. Um, for those of you that watch my other stuff, um, tomorrow we will be having the Lost Memory Second Chances campaign and the Heart of Darkness campaign will be on Sunday as usual. Um, Next week on Friday, hold on, I gotta go look at my schedule. <laughs> it will be an Alicorn discusses ancient Alicorns. So Ooh. we will be doing that one. Boom, boom, boom. Other than that, be sure to check out everybody's links in the description. I have links for all of the uh, guests tonight. As well as uh, check out the links for the Discord if you want to come and hang out with some of the people that uh, stick around after the uh, podcast that they're in. And then um, 
if you want to show further support to the channel, there's Patreon, YouTube membership, all, all that good stuff. Big thank you to my $10 tier patrons, Cameo Shadowness, uh, Ice Crystal, Skarmex, and I am drawing a massive blank on his name. Hold on just a second. Apparently it is just that, one of those days. Uh, Trailblazer, that's what it was. Don't mind me, apparently I went senile for a moment. Other than that, um, be sure to uh, check us out tomorrow for the Lost Memories stream. And other than that, everybody have a great evening, and don't forget to drink water. Mm-hmm.